just remember, I'm the better looking one, of course. Yeah, well, I'm the one that, that actually <laughs> exists in real life, so. Yeah, David's the one that you're actually gonna see at a conference. Yeah. Hey, Bankless Nation, happy last week of July. Summer's almost over, but happy Friday morning to you. We're gonna be drinking a cup of coffee mm-hmm. as we enjoy the weekly roll-up. We hope you are as well. David, how are you doing today? Oh, absolutely fantastic, Ryan. Um, some more for eight, three arrows capital fallout. Uh, we saw we said last week that it was probably coming, but as far as it goes, that's like the only contagion stuff we have to talk this about. Is this, week. this is it. Is the last time it. we talk this about three three arrows capital? Well, I don't know about that, but like the topics <laughs> like Celsius seems to be over, Voyager's over. It's only three arrows capital that's left. All right. I, getting some closure this week, mm-hmm. hopefully. Uh, we're also going to be talking about Coinbase. An employee mm-hmm. got arrested for insider trading. Yeah, you can yeah. be an insider trader at, at Coinbase, and there's some fallout with the SEC uh, and Coinbase. They got into another tussle, and the, right. even the CFTC is weighing in on this. We're going to cover that as well. Big drama, big drama in the regulatory space, and the last test net. The last test net ever. This is the last step before the actual merge is scheduled. It's here. The Gorley Tesnet is coming in the 6th to 12th of August. We don't know when because it's uh, set by a TTD number. We'll talk about that later. But Ryan, it's happening. The merge. <laughs> it's happening. It's Ron happening. Pa- Ron Paul, ah, it's happening. Yeah. Lights in the background. That's great. As always, guys, this comes at you every Friday morning. This is the best way to recap your week in crypto. Hope you're joining us. And uh, make sure you like and subscribe Please if do. you are. So if you're on YouTube, make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel. And if you are listening to this on podcast form, rate and review wherever you listen to your podcast. On Spotify, by the way, this is now in video version. We partnered with Spotify. They partnered with us. I don't know. What are the other? We now have bankless video mm-hmm. capability on Spotify, which gives us another platform be- beyond YouTube. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I enjoy it. Yeah. If you're a, a Spotify listener, you can become a Spotify viewer. And huh. then at the crypto conferences, people can stop mixing me and you up. <laughs> 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 That's great. Just remember, I'm the better looking one, of course. Yeah, well, I'm the one that, that actually <laughs> exists in real life, so. Yeah, David's the one that you're actually going to see at a conference. Yeah. Like, so it's definitely going to be David, all right? Um, all right, we should also talk about our friends at RhinoFi. I know they wanted us to get the message out that formerly, formerly they were called Diversify, <laughs> and now they are Ron- RhinoFi. Formerly, they were also a decentralized exchange, and now they are more than that. You can mm-hmm. swap. You can also trade, of course. You can deposit into liquidity pools. What else can you do with RhinoFi? So RhinoFi just uh, abstracts all of the many, many chains that are existing and coming online in this multi-chain future. So you know, all the basic stuff, like Ryan said, like trading and swapping, but you can also you know, put your, your assets into liquidity pools. Uh, you can also uh, invest them in, in various parts of uh, inside of the multi-chain future. Uh, and as we just go and grow and grow in complexity, uh, stuff like this is gonna be more and more needed in order to just like manage all of your DeFi stuff uh, for across all of the chains. The reason why it looks like this on Ryan uh, windows because every time we start recording i have him squeeze his window uh real tight. yeah real tight uh but it's no, uh, it would look a little bit more expanded on your desktop when you when you go to the link in the show notes uh to go check it out yeah go check it out i think part of the reason that um we got so burned last cycle not we i mean crypto collectively and using c5 platforms is because mm-hmm. DeFi user interfaces weren't there yet it was just easier to de- deposit in celsius and BlockFi. but mm-hmm. now with rhino fives of the world we are upgrading our DeFi experience. And just a reminder, C5 failed this cycle, but DeFi didn't. Mm-hmm. This is a way to double down on it, start leveling up using tools like RhinoFi. It's 100% bankless. So this is bankless. all on a layer two. Which 100% is pretty organic. Cool. Free <laughs> 100% bankless organic uh, <laughs> experience for you here. All right, David, let's get to the markets. Bitcoin, it. what's it doing? Some good things. Uh, Bitcoin started the week at $23,200. Ending the week at $23,700, up 2.5%. Up 2.5%. Nice green we'll week. Take it. Good uh, job, green, green weeks, stacking on green weeks. We got, I think, three, three green weeks in a row, Ryan. Three knock green. on wood. Knock on Does wood. That happen? Yeah. That, that, that can happen that, during the bear that's market. That's allowed. Hmm. It's allowed. <laughs> but the bigger story yeah. was this one. What's this yeah. chart telling us? This is, a, <laughs> this is a Bitcoin chart again, but let me actually pull up the Ethereum the chart. chart. Yeah, Because I we think the one. lines we are a bit steeper one. upward. What are we looking at? Started the the week at fifteen seventy. We are currently clocking in at seventeen twenty six. Wow! Up eight point seven percent. Was it was it last week that ETH was up thirty percent? Mm-hmm. I think it was. Yeah. So again, just stacking. Do that on math in your head. Greens to work. Oh, don't ask me to that do 8% that. No, no. That eight percent plus the thirty percent. We're thirty eight percent on two weeks. No, that's sir. not how it works. You can't add. You can't oh, add right. percentages. I know. 
Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. I'd now. have to go back to the 14 day. Right, right, right. Yeah. The good news uh, is we're green, we're up, and mm-hmm. we're heading in a good direction. Um, I think there's a story here. Uh, so, did, did you see it just like suddenly leap up? Yeah. I guess yeah. that was Wednesday, on the day mm-hmm. of recording. And that's something to do with the Fed, actually. Yeah. Jerome Powell yeah. spoke that line, that nice green candle into existence, I think. And we're going get to get to why that is in that story. But before we do, let's God, take I'd love a quick... to be able to speak green candles into existence. Yeah, that would, only that Powell. Be a, could, sorry. That, that'd be a sick you have superpower. to apply for the position of central banker, David. <laughs> oh, I'm Do you out. want that job? I'm out. No. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> sounds like a terrible job. Yeah, it sounds like an awful Like, job. honestly, everyone hates you all of the time. <laughs> sorry, Powell. ETH Bitcoin ratio. What's the ratio telling us? Up 6.2%. Uh, is up to 0.02. My ETH BTC trade finally coming back to parity. <laughs> is that a real trade you made, or is that yeah, a trade oh, yeah. in your head? A, a, a long, no, a long time ago. I've been holding it. Oh, really? Yeah, I've been knuckling it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sir, I've never had the guts to make that trade. People trade yeah, the, on the ratio. The I'm just sh- like, short oh. Bitcoin, long Ether. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I would do that by just holding ETH over Bitcoin over the long time horizon, but like right. actually trading this ratio is like. Mm-hmm scary to me spooky right. territory yeah i admire you david yeah. have i told well, you that well uh, thank you <laughs> don't, don't don't you shouldn't you should admire me for other reasons other than my trades. You're trading you're trading <laughs> yeah. not your trading game yeah. uh we could always look at the e- D- dpi ratio if um you oh, know, God. if you're curious about ratios but how about the crypto market cap are we above a trillion this week yeah we're above a trillion we were at one trillion last week we are up to 1.138 trillion uh, the math is easy this week. We are up 13.8%. <laughs> nice. Uh, nice. Gas prices still down on Ethereum? Uh, gas prices are like crazy low. 10. Yeah. 10 guay. Average guay fee. You know what You know what would be like super ironic, Ryan? What? Is if like we merge and, and there's ether, no burn? Ether is no. not deflationary. There's no ultrasound money after all of this. <laughs> after all of that. <laughs> uh, so like the, the deflationary wow. threshold is 7 and we are at 10. Ah. <gasps> We're just hanging on. We're hanging on. Tooth so, um, Tooth I don't know. Nail. What's so funny is when transaction fees are high, people mm-hmm. get bearish or, mm-hmm. because they're like, Ethereum is not scaling. What's the mm-hmm. matter? Transaction fees are so high. Now, on the flip side, when transaction fees are low, they're like, bearish again no right. one's using ethereum david right. yeah it's, a, it's yeah, like it's a lose lose scenario bear, yeah bearish when fees are high bearish when fees are low i mean okay then that just means you're just a bearish person yeah probably uh i'm optimistic in both of these cases so it's a good mm-hmm. time to get your transaction fees through yeah. Yeah. um but i do hope i mean just for the posterity of it like post merge we got to be ultrasound right we got to be oh, we gotta, burning we gotta more be, ETH. we got to be i issue. will i will just personally spam the network with my <laughs> 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 please do just for like you know five just minutes Meme. Just for the meme, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Five, well, by the way, about... five minutes of spanning Ethereum, I'm pretty sure that is at least like half a million dollars. Mm. So I will mm. not I will not actually be doing that. Like call in, we'll create a DAO for it, you know, <laughs> ultrasound DAO. I don't know. <laughs> ultrasound get, sound backstop. Get Lubin to help. Um, okay, markets. The Fed press release. So um, the big Powell mm. raise uh, came out, I guess, uh, on Wednesday. Uh, the Federal Reserve issued a statement that said... Mm. They were going to increase the federal funds rate, that's the interest rate, of course, uh, to two and a quarter to two and a half percent. That is a 0.75 increase, uh, the, bringing the, the target rate number. to 2.5%. Mm-hmm. So they call that uh, 0.75 uh, is 75 bips. This is, of course, the um, biggest rate hike, I believe, let me see, since Volcker. Um, the fastest tightening of monetary policy since Fed Chair Paul Vol- Volcker battled double-digit inflation in the 1990s is the headline here. Um, weak economic data was the reason, although Powell did say here, here's a quote from him, I do not think the U.S. is currently in recession. He told yeah. reporters that after the end of the, the latest policy meeting, uh, and he cited unemployment rate that is still near a half-century low and solid wage growth and job gains. It doesn't make sense that the U.S. would be in a recession. What's interesting about that statement, though, is I remember last summer he was telling us about transitory inflation. Right. And this summer now he's, he's saying, about transitory I don't think the U.S. is not in a recession, and that wouldn't right. make sense at all. Right. So I'm not actually sure whether he believes that or not, or is kind of playing the act, or um, yeah, so what I this have, is. I, I've been thinking about this a lot this last week, actually. is After listening to... Uh, like Lynn Alden and Luke Grom in our podcast, but also content that uh, that Kyla Scanlon has been putting out. 
I mean, I actually think that every single word that comes out of the Fed Reserve is an act. Yeah. There is nothing that is actually him. It's there's nothing that is not specified. Everything is done as like a theater. There it's is another no, lever to tinker with the economy. Yes, yes, that's like yeah, yeah. We we talk about what are the levers of the tool of the Fed. They have interest rates and they have quantitative easing and tightening. They also have how they appear as a big <laughs> tool, a narrative. And so that is actually probably the biggest tool. And so I think when you read these statements by the Fed and you see you see the words that the Fed, the Fed chair does not think that the U.S. is currently in a recession. That is not what the Fed chair actually thinks. That is what he wants you to think that he thinks that uh, <laughs> that doesn't work forever. Right. Because if okay, so this is well, markets are just a hall of mirrors. Sure, like, but it's what, like well, they think this, so I think this, so they think that, so I think this. Right, but like it's kind of the Keynesian beauty. Like once we start to know that the Fed chair is actually not telling us the truth, but is telling us what he wants us to believe, right. then it's we like no inception. You listen. have to you have to go one layer deeper at that point, <laughs> yes. and then and then so does the Fed. And then we go one layer deeper. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. If we could just outsource this to robots and code, that would be so much simpler. <laughs> yeah, um, zero layers deep. Wow. Wouldn't that be nice? Th the question is though, is this uh, a peak in the inflation rate? I think mm -hmm. that's a question. We had 9.1%, remember last time. But um, mm -hmm. what was interesting about this, I think, David, is what we'll get to next. The market actually liked this. Yes. So think about big. this. We go 0 0.75, 75 bips up pretty big raise, pretty big yeah. move to tightening, but the market had kind of expected this to yeah. happen. And Known then what quantity. do you think the market does? Does it go down or does it go up? Well, up is the answer to that. NASDAQ yeah. shot up, crypto yeah. shot up. And we're going to get into a thread as to the reason for that. But let me ask you, David, were you surprised at that? Nothing surprises me anymore. <laughs> So tightening and we go up. I just up, don't have an opinion on to, as to the direction of the market. I'm, I've been in buy only mode for the past like three months. Do you know it sounds? It seems counterintuitive though, right? It's like mm -hmm. you actually like raise rates and then mm -hmm. Nasdaq and crypto would you know pop up, and that's why we're seeing the the ETH pop of nine percent right. this week, and also you right. know Bitcoin up this week. It was it was actually after the Fed meeting. Right. Uh, why don't we get into this thread? What is uh, a great, Macro great Elf thread. saying? This is this is a voice I've increasingly enjoyed on uh, macro topics, but uh, why don't you read this out? It's a whole thread about this. Yeah, so Macro Alf, A-L-F, says, Powell hikes 75 basis points, and yet NASDAQ and Bitcoin are going to the moon. What the heck? While I disagree with the unfolding market narrative here, let me try to explain why we are witnessing such a rally. Dis uh, despite open rec openly recognizing economic growth is if softening the Fed unanimously, exclamation point, decided to hike BIPs by 75%. It's all about inflation, inflation, inflation. But markets convincingly started to rally only when Powell went ahead and said the following, quote, we are now at levels broadly in line with our estimates of neutral interest rates. And after front loading our hiking cycle, we until until now, we will be much more data dependent going forward. Let's find out why this is so relevant. Uh, so Macro Alf continues and says, the neutral rate is the prevailing rate at which the economy runs at its potential without overheating or excessively cooling down. I think, I think that is called threading the needle. I think that's called a soft landing. With the 75 bips hike, the Fed just reached its estimate of a neutral rate. From here, they aren't contributing to economic heating anymore. Uh, and then here we see a graph. Um, and then he continues, uh, but that also means any hikes from here are going to put the Fed in an actively restrictive territory. So I think he's saying that we are, have established an equilibrium with the economy. The economy is not going to go up. It's not going to go down. It's going to be flat. Uh, and so he continues and says, but that means that any hikes from here are going to put the Fed in an actively restrictive territory. The bond market knows that every time the Fed becomes restrictive, they break something. So Powell was asked a couple of very important questions. I'm guessing, I'm guessing in like the, uh, the after the statement, they had like a press uh, like seminar thing where the reporters could talk to them. Uh, what about bond market pricing? Uh, 70 bips cuts in 20, uh, 2023. What about financial conditions? Uh, so what about forward guidance? And so this is when the quote, from here on out, we are fully data dependent from and Jerome that's Powell. The becomes, that's, that's the, the key quote. That's the quote at which the rally started, the, the right. rally started happening in the markets. Before that, it mm -hmm. was kind of nothing. The 0.75 did nothing to the markets. But this statement from here, onwards, we are fully data dependent. That was the differentiator. Right. And so the, the, the question of what about forward guidance 
is answered by from here on on for here onwards we are fully data dependent meaning forward guidance is gone and so again the thread continues why is this relevant it all starts from a very strong opinion that the bond market has developed uh, uh, the strong opinion that the bond market has developed about inflation over the last few months it's going to move down and very fast inflation the bond market thinks the inflation is going to go down fast, bigly. Uh, between July 23 and 24, the CPI is priced to print at about 2.9%. So we're at, where were we at? 9.1% last month. Uh, the, allegedly the bond market and between July 23 and July 24, the CPI is priced in from the bond market to be at 2.9%, basically at target. So the bond market is pricing in that the Federal Reserve is going to get inflation under control in about one year's time. So if Powell is not nearly on autopilot on anymore and the markets have a strong opinion on inflation and growth collapsing, they can also price all other assets based on this scenario. So basically saying, if the bond market is pricing this in, so is everything else. If you look under the hood, market action also validates this narrative. Hence why you know QQQ, the NASDAQ is going up, Bitcoin is going up, crypto is going up, uh, and so. What's performing here, outperforming here, NASDAQ and crypto, of course, as I just said. If the Fed isn't going to tighten financial conditions on autopilot anymore, real yields will actually start declining again. Uh, and here we actually do see yields uh, start to, to decline. And they continue. Again, we're almost done. When real yields decline, value intensive and risk sentiment driven assets classes outperform. That's because the marginal return for owning cash USD becomes less attractive and the incentive to chase risk assets is larger, such as QQQ, the Nasdaq and Bitcoin. Do I think this rally has legs? Question mark. I can rationalize the narrative being built post FOMC, but no forward guidance equals a very, very volatile Fed ahead of us. One small hawkish turn and it's all gone. You must, you must price in some additional risk premium here, not less. Basically what he is saying is that the bond market has priced in, we're solving inflation in one year's time. So as soon, and because the Federal Reserve is not operating under a forward guidance scenario anymore, they are saying we are completely data driven at this point. If the data comes out and shows that we are not solving inflation within one year time, the market is not positioned for that and will likely react to that in a volatile manner, like hint into the downside. Uh, and so that that's like the main conclusion to this thread. Yeah. So the 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 TLDR is that you know, data driven statement had the, mm -hmm. has the market thinking that the Fed is done increasing for now. Like nothing more than sort of expected. It won't get super yeah. ultra aggressive, right? That's what the market thinks. But the reason this rally might be tenuous is because if the market is wrong about that and right. inflation is much more persistent, it may drive the Fed's hand to change right. because now the Fed is data driven, apparently. So can you trust this rally mm -hmm. is, is a question of, I don't know, can, can you like, what is inflation going to be in the future? That's mm -hmm. sort of how tenuous this is right now. So Certainly. I don't know. I mean, it's it's cool to see a rally like this, I, I, I suppose, but we're probably not out of the woods yet. Uh, and uh, I guess we're all pretty data dependent from here on out. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the, the data is going to be the thing leading the market is an interesting place to be. NFTs. You know, last week we were <laughs> nice talking transition. about- Nice transition. Yeah, it's just a, just a nice soft transition to- <laughs> Something that matters a lot less soft, than the global soft monetary policy, I guess. <laughs> the NFT price floor. Actually, I was looking for a um, dashboard mm -hmm. of kind of the, the biggest like by market cap uh, NFT projects. And I found this, nftpricefloor.com. Someone sent Great it to website. us. We Great can include website. this from time to time. But quick mm -hmm. recap, David, what are we looking at? Just like maybe the top five. Mm -hmm. How big are the top five NFT projects by floor cap? Yeah, so I really like this measurement, floor cap, which is the price floor multiplied by the number of assets, which is basically what a market cap is, judged by the floor. Uh, so coming in at number one, of course, Board Ape Yacht Club, floor cap of 857,000 Ether, followed by CryptoPunks at 714,000 Ether. That, that gap is way closer than I thought it was. Uh, once upon a time, like Board Apes were like almost three times uh, uh, CryptoPunks. Now they're almost at parity, followed by Mutant Apes, Other Deed for Other Sides, Moonbirds, uh, Clone X, I don't know what that is, uh, and then Autoglyphs. Do you know 857, so Bored Apes, uh, equates to about 1.5 billion? Wanna, I don't want to know. Oh, 1.5 billion 
That's the value of 10,000 board eight yeah. NFTs right now. But there's not enough, there's not that much like liquidity there. There's 477 uh, ether that was traded in the last 24 hours. Which I get a decent volume, I guess. I wonder decent if volume. like um, NFTs continue to become more financialized, mm -hmm. if uh, we'll see this kind of you know free up a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. to your point, they're super illiquid right now, but like what happens if you can kind of um, lend against them, borrow against them? Uh, I don't know. Does that change the liquidity of them? Um, yeah, I think it should. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Anyway, well, we'll look at this they, from time if, to yeah. time to see the health of the NFT market. Uh, let's move to... I, I expect there to be different things there in the future. I, I would not expect like this. this remember, do you ever remember... Um, what was it? Coin market cap before there was Coin Gecko, well, and there, like yeah. look looking at like the total market cap in 2017, mm -hmm. like it's it's completely foreign to what it is now because like things rotate out of like the top 10. Oh, okay. I expect that I, bet, I expect there to be big rotation out of the top 10. Oh, that's a good take. Yeah, yeah, so you don't like think CryptoPunks uh, you know stays in the top five? Or oh, crypto punk, in the crypto five? punks in the in the top five. Uh, David's a crypto, crypto punks maximalist. Yeah. I I just anyway, I was anyways I got this them. NFT project to shell. Yeah, <laughs> crypto punk maximalist. Okay. Yeah. Um, merge, David. You want to talk about the merge? We, I do want to talk about coming. the merge, Ryan. How did you know I wanted to talk about the merge? <sighs> it's so exciting. Okay, it's, this is it's happening, and mm -hmm. I guess uh, you know, quick tease in the market section today. Um, this is from DeFi Surfer. More than seven billion of annual sell pressure. It's $20 million of daily sell pressure will be eliminated the day the merge is complete. How press reminds us of that. Yes. This is not yes. how press, but something that he would say. Going to be yeah. fireworks for the month following the merge. I don't know if you saw this chart, David, but mm -hmm. again, once again, we're talking about post-merge. ETH issuance is going to be reduced like 4.1% to 0%, hopefully negative in the negative territory, right? Uh, <laughs> I hope so. Um, and that's an 87% reduction. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Issuance reduction of 87%. The triple halvening. It's like three halvenings in a row if you're used to kind of Bitcoiner uh, terminology. And that is happening. Mm -hmm. So if, if the test net is happening in early August, we'll get to what that means for like potential mainnet deployment. But we know what this means for issuance is a massive amount of sell pressure will be nice. removed from the market at day one. So Ryan, uh, I just want to help put into context how big $7 billion is. Off the top of your head, do you know how much capital, how much dollars MicroStrategy has purchased of Bitcoin? Not how much Bitcoin that they have in dollar terms, how many dollars they've used to purchase Bitcoin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw, throw a number at you, okay? Yeah. You ready to catch? Hit okay. Me. Hit me. Two billion. Four, four billion. Okay. Four, they have spent four billion dollars on Bitcoin, and with this, with the you know post merge, Ethereum basically gets. We have this current equilibrium of where we are now, and post merge we have this a new equilibrium which is equivalent to a seven billion dollar buyer coming in yearly, every single year, dollar cost on repeat. Averaging. Until history ends. More reliable than billion. Michael Saylor, even. Yes, much more reliable. Like, Michael Saylor is out of cash. Is I don't he, know if you've noticed, but his like cash, the amount smaller. of that he's bought is like, now he, whenever he's like, oh, Michael Saylor bought Bitcoin, it's like he's adding 0.01% of like to his, to his uh, stack. Yeah. $7 billion yearly. Yearly. Yeah. What, what's, great, what's cool about this too is like, if you're an ETH holder, every time the Ethereum block space sells some blocks to somebody, which is what this mm -hmm. is, is Ethereum selling blocks, you get money. <laughs> How great is that? It's so awesome. <laughs> I mean, anyway, we're excited about the merge. Uh, let's talk about this going into the merge. All right, this is from mm -hmm. Felix Hartman, and this is a total market capitalizations, the old, good old Bitcoin dominance chart. This is what Felix mm -hmm. says. We're well into the bear market, yet unlike the previous one, Bitcoin dominance is still bleeding lower while ETH dominance is on a steady ride. rise. ETH is now a mere 120% outperformance away from flipping Bitcoin. ETH Oof. did around 120 performance outperformance from January 2020 to September 2020, so nothing crazy. David, before, yeah. is the flipping back on the menu, sir? Okay, so flipping has always been on the menu, but also people are like, oh, one day like Ether might flip Bitcoin. Like all the ETH, all the ETH people say that, me including. Um, but like people like forget that like the flipping is just 
the first flipping. Like then there's the second flipping, and then there's the third flipping. Like where you just start lapping Bitcoin over and over and over again. Like you're allowed oh, to you be. Oh, you mean like doubling? Like yeah, you double Bitcoin, then okay. you triple Bitcoin, and then you quadruple Bitcoin. Oh, geez. Yeah, come on, yeah, yeah. man. Don't don't grave dance on Bitcoin, okay? I see. It can be number two and be <laughs> fine. I'm sorry, know, but fundamentals are fundamentals. What, what do you think about what rules. do you think about this take? Because I've seen this increasingly, and it happens yeah. whenever um, big, uh, ETH is coming closer to flipping Bitcoin, especially in the Bitcoin maximalist community. It's like if you flip in Bitcoin, mm, right. you destroy the entire store sovereign non sovereign yeah, right. store of value meme. Like you so kill it all. It's one of the many, many ass backwards takes out of the Bitcoin Maxi <laughs> camp. What, what they mean to say is like, if you flip Bitcoin, well then you like, you remove the king and then you just make it so like somebody can flip you. Yes. No, the correct take is if Bitcoin gets flipped by the second chain, then it'll probably get flipped by the third chain and it'll probably get flipped by the fourth chain Ooh. too. It's a problem for Bitcoin. If somebody, if something flips Bitcoin, it's because they effing deserved it because their fundamentals are strong, not because some like magical, ooh, we popped the, the, the immaculate nature of Bitcoin and it's like manifest destiny to be the biggest crypto ever. It's that fundamentals matter and Bitcoin hasn't been paying attention to Would fundamentals since Would you say the Genesis. same thing, David, if Ether... What? Got flipping, and I will remind if you. Ether it got has. flipped. XRP. Yes, flipped yes. it. Right. Uh, one point in time. Something else did too. I'm misrecalling this. Uh, XRP Bitcoin at least. Cash. Maybe Bitcoin XRP cash twice. It. it was Bitcoin Cash. That Bitcoin Cash it as well. Uh, yeah. Right. So did did XRP and Bitcoin Cash deserve it? Or are you talking about a flipping that is more sustained in terms more of more sustained? Yeah, more sustained, and like not when markets are just super illiquid and young. And also that happened during the irrationality of the the bear market, like. But it's, it's simultaneously when XRP flipped, uh, like, yeah, flipped Ether, Ether was also $80, which I would also say was extremely irrational. That was just an irrational time in the market. I, um, I also find it ironic that, um, like, kind of if you're a Bitcoin maximalist, your whole purpose in life is to actually, like, flip in gold. Right? Right. Isn't that the whole thing? And, like, mm -hmm. well, if gold can be flippant, I don't know, that that is the king by Bitcoin. Right. Like, I don't know, it's just, like... Right. Of right. course, better stores. If, of value if Bitcoin flips things, gold, right. the, the world just destroys, Ryan. <laughs> That's what a gold maximalist might say. <laughs> Peter Schiff Peter gets you on the podcast. Um, no, no, no. No? Have you ever heard no. him speak? Oh, God, yeah, it's awful. Uh, I haven't in a long time. It's been a okay, while. Okay, actually, he's one of those people where, like, his macro takes are super awesome. Mm. His asset takes are terrible. Mm. Yeah, I know right. those people. I know those people. Yeah, all the Bitcoiners. Those people don't have enough ETH. Uh <laughs> Let's talk about this for a second. This God, is just we are, the maxi hats are on today. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> toning down. I'm just excited about the merge, David. Yeah. Um, he who controls the infrastructure controls the universe. This is Greg tweeting this out, and this is a kind of an org chart of um, SBF, Sam Bankman Fried, um, mm -hmm. beloved uh, crypto banker, and he has been on a buying spree this cycle. Right, um, assets that are kind of like have depreciated massively. Other crypto banks bailed, helped bail out um, BlockFi, and I think the take here is that's great. Uh, Sam managed his money very well and is very well positioned for this. It's also a little bit alarming to me to see even more consolidation in the CFI space. Like all of yeah. the the companies that managed to stay healthy and, and retain a balance sheet are now buying all of the companies that didn't. And so mm -hmm. what we get, the result of like all of these kind of acquisitions is further and further consolidation and centralization. CZ is also doing the same thing. And I'm just like, okay, these are smart business people. I get it. But it's another reason why DeFi looks like very hopeful and very bright is because we've always been concerned at Bankless that if we just replace one set of bankers with another yeah. set of, of central bankers. We haven't really achieved anything in this whole crypto right. journey. Right. And like, I'm not faulting SBF or CZ for being like responsible and good business people in doing this, but I'm just saying like the system is kind of broken if it's all consolidated with a new set of bankers. Like we got a new JP Morgan on the scene and he's SBF. All right, coming up next, like I said, three errors capital is on the table. They speak, Suzu and, and Kyle Davies, they did an interview with Bloomberg. They actually said words. So we're gonna read out some of the quotes to hear what they have to say. I'm gonna go ahead and put on my Fed cap for that one, saying like if all the words that coming out of Kyle Davies and, and Suzu are not their true selves, but instead an act, 
because that's probably what they have to do in the moment. Anyways, after that, Coinbase Insider Trading opens the window to, for the SEC to target the entire industry. So there's two parts to this story. A, uh, insider trading at Coinbase, that's bad, but just like kind of an open shut case. The, what the SEC is doing as a result of that is terrible and needs to stop and now it's triggered the attention of the CFTC. So we're gonna get into all those details and more and the rest of the show right after we get through some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. Arbitrum is an Ethereum layer two scaling solution that is going to completely change how we use DeFi and NFTs. Some of the coolest new NFT collections have chosen Arbitrum as their home, while DeFi protocols continue to see increased liquidity and usage. You can now bridge straight into Arbitrum for more than 10 different exchanges, including Binance, FTX, Huobi, and Crypto.com. Once on Arbitrum, you'll enjoy fast transactions with cheap fees, allowing you to explore new frontiers of the crypto universe. New to Arbitrum, for a limited time, you can get Arbitrum NFTs designed by the famous artist Ratwell and Sugoi for joining the Arbitrum Odyssey. The Odyssey is an eight week long event where you complete on-chain activities and receive a free NFT as a reward. Find out more by visiting the Discord at discord.gg slash Arbitrum. You can also bridge your assets to Arbitrum at bridge.arbitrum.io and access all of Arbitrum's apps at portal.arbitrum.one in order to experience DeFi and NFTs the way it was always meant to be, fast, cheap, secure, and friction free. The Brave browser is the user-first browser for the Web3 internet, with over 60 million monthly active users. And inside the Brave browser, you'll find the Brave wallet, the secure multi-chain crypto wallet built right into the browser. Web3 is freedom from big tech and Wall Street, more control and better privacy, but there's a weak point in Web3, your crypto wallet. And most crypto wallets are browser extensions, which can easily be spoofed. But the Brave wallet is different. No extensions are required, which gives Brave browser an extra level of security versus other wallets. Brave wallet is your secure passport for the possibilities of Web3, and supports multiple chains, including Ethereum and Solana. You can even buy crypto directly inside the wallet with RAMP. And of course, you can store, send, and swap your crypto assets, manage your NFTs, and connect to other wallets and DeFi apps. So whether you're new to crypto or you're a seasoned pro, it's time to ditch those risky extensions and it's time to switch to the Brave wallet. Download Brave at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. Hey guys, we are back uh, talking first about Three Arrows Capital. I, I wouldn't mind, David, if this is the last time for a while we talk about Three Arrows Capital. And I feel like uh, this kind of gives us maybe a little bit of closure on this story. But the story is Kyle Davies and Suzu, who are the founders of Thero's Capital and definitely in the spotlight, they spoke this week. It's their first interview. It wasn't on Bankless. It was on Bloomberg in written form. And we have some of their quotes here. David, what are some of the qu- choice quotes okay. from this article that in Bloomberg? Three years Capital founders break their silence over the collapse mm-hmm. of the crypto hedge fund. What did they say? Yeah, first one comes in from Suzu, and he says, people may call us stupid. They may call us stupid or delusional, and I'll accept that. Maybe. (laughs) (laughs) He said maybe? But but they're gonna, you know, say that I absconded funds during the last period where I actually put more of my personal money back in. So that's not true. Like, the absconding is not true. Um, Again, like, my take, I was gonna say this to the end, but I'll say it here. This kind of feels like a whole like PR stunt. Like why would Three Hours Capital take an interview with Bloomberg? It's because they, they need to fight their image right now because it's probably relevant in court. Uh, that's my take. I'm gonna go ahead and poison the well here with that. Uh, quote number two uh, from, the, from the article, advisors in charge of liquidating the fund said in Ju- the July 8th filings that Sue and Davies hadn't cooperated with them and that the founders' whereabouts were unknown. Sue said death threats had forced them into hiding. Quote, this does not mean that we've been, uh, that we haven't been communicating with all relevant authorities, said Zhu in the telephone interview with Davies and two lawyers from Saltaire LLP. We have commu- been communicating for, with them from day one. Again, um, again, PR management, again, is, is my take, is my take. Uh, quote number three, this whole situation is very regrettable, yeah, Kyle right, Davies says. Say. Many Plus people lost that. a lot of money. Yeah, it is very regrettable. That is certainly true. Uh, quote number four, uh, efforts by Sue and Davies to deflect blame are a sharp contrast to the pair's previously relentless campaign of cheerleading crypto assets and belittling critics. Nerves were raked anew this week by creditor claims that the founders put a down payment on a $50 million yacht before the fund went under, Oof. a claim Sue Zhu said was a part of a smear campaign. Uh, the boat was, quote, bought over a year ago and commissioned to be built and used in Europe, Sue said. He rejected the perception that he enjoyed a, an extravagant lifestyle, noting that he biked to work and back every day and that his family only had two homes in Singapore. That's it? <laughs> it's just, 
living on the poverty line here. <laughs> you had two homes. Okay. Uh, quote, we have never been seen in any club spending lots of money. We have never been seen, you know, kind of driving Ferraris and Lam Lamborghinis around, Sue said. This is kind of smearing us, I feel. It's just a classic playbook of, you know, when this stuff happens, when fun blows up, then you know these are kind of the headlines that people like to play. Hmm. <laughs> Quote number five. <laughs> uh, what we failed to realize was that Luna was capable of falling to effectively zero in a matter of days and that this would catalyze a credit squeeze across the industry that would put significant pressure on all of our illiquid positions, Sue said. Jeez. After, th after that day when Bitcoin went from 30,000 to 20,000, that was extremely painful for us, says Kyle. And in that, that ended up being the kind of the nail in the coffin. Uh, last quote for Kyle and I, there's so many crazy people in crypto that we kind of, uh, that kind of made death threats or all of this kind of noise said Sue. We feel that it's just in the interest of, for everyone. If we, phys if we can be physically secured and keep a low profile, I think that is maybe it is in the interest of everyone. Maybe not. It's definitely in the interest of Kyle Davies and Sue Zhu to be physically secured and keep a low profile. That's for sure. Yeah, and of course, death threats uh, are are not cool. Under that's probably that's probably true. They are probably actually getting death threats. Yeah, I, I believe. That I mean, 100%. that is a legitimate reason for yeah. for um, hiding. Right. But like, I, right. I but reading some death, of these quotes, death threats and not cooperating with the council. Did you are hear an apology? Things. No, what? did I you heard, hear? I heard. I heard that it was very regrettable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe we made yeah. some mistakes along the way. That that's. Right. Um, I read this article because it was fascinating because as I said before, like, I feel like I wanted some closure from this Sure. because uh, like, I can't hearing this now, if you're just new to crypto, I can't describe to you how revered these guys yes. were three years capital yeah. were during the, they the, were like the bull trader market. gods, trader gods, greatest traders to ever live. Right. Like just, this is just what it felt like crypto Twitter and, and the broader community kind of bought up. Like, you want to see the, the best traders in the world. It's Suzu, Kyle Davis, Three Years Capital. Um, and so I wanted to understand how mechanically they went bust, right, from their perspective. And this is what I gleaned from the story between the, the quotes about yachts and such. So how did Three Years Capital go bust? Number one, they failed to manage risk. Yeah, kind of a requirement to go bust. Quote, quote from the article, we yeah. believed in everything to the fullest. Not the kind of thing you want to say <laughs> if you're managing risk. And by the way, th these are not just lessons for Three Rows Capital. These are lessons that are applicable to us. Right. How do we not fall in the Three Rows Capital track? So they went all in on these speculative projects. They used margin. They didn't hedge. It's kind of like gambling. If you were approaching crypto like that, it's not the way to do it. Number two, they got wrecked by Luna. We failed to realize that Luna was capable of falling to effectively zero in a matter of days. What happened, I think, David, is something that can happen to you everyday investors, people on the bankless journey, is you get FOMO. You get, mm. in this case, Alt-1 FOMO. And what happened was Thero's Capital missed a number of big Alt-1 run-ups, right? They missed that whole Solana thing that Multicoin and friends got, uh, got in on. And so they started to believe their own narratives. They wanted to play catch-up, right. and they added risk in an effort to catch up. They didn't have to do this, but they wanted to get more out of the Alt-1 narrative and so they went in on Luna and they went in big. Big. Also bigly. Avalanche, I think. Yeah. Um, number three, they got wrecked by uh, staked ETH, depegging from ETH. The quote from the article is, are there people who, uh, there are people who also leverage long staked ETH versus Ether who will get liquidated as the market goes down? The answer to that question is yes. So they didn't appropriately manage the risks when they were entering into kind of these um, uh, these markets mm -hmm. uh, that were somewhat obvious, right? Of course, you can't make the assumption that DAI is always going to stay pegged to a dollar. You can't always make the assumption that staked ETH is always going to maintain its peg with ETH. And if you are um, margining and risking some of your assets based on that assumption, that is a bad move. Number four, they got wrecked by GBDC, as many people did, because everyone did it. Then the trust went to the discount and then went um, to a, a far bigger discount than anyone thought possible. So like during these kind of market events, things can happen that you don't expect, uh, like GBTC depegging in such a big way. Mm -hmm. And they didn't consider that. And then of course, like they didn't do the classic thing of they weren't ready for Bitcoin to go to 20K. Right. This is Suzu again. Bitcoin went from 30K to 20K. That was extremely painful for us. That ended up being the nail in the coffin. Crypto investor, are you ready for a 90% drop in your assets? 
Okay. In the last bear cycle, ETH went down by 95%. Right. I knew many a good crypto investor who got l their positions liquidated Hello. in something like MakerDAO. All right. <laughs> it's like in these, these people are great investors. Full, full confession. Yeah. I was one of them too. Oh, yeah, there, there we go. Where's that and po I, app? I think we both would have that po app. Well, I d like so I didn't get liquidated, but it came closer yeah. than I ever mm. want to feel again. Yeah. All right, so like you got to be ready for these drops. Summary of the lessons for us from the three hours capital bust. Number one, how do you avoid this in the future? They went bust because they took too much leverage. They believed their own hype. They mm. bought the top on speculative assets. They weren't ready for a 90% drawdown, and they invested more than they could afford to lose. At the end of the day, this is basic stuff. Yeah, it's almost right. noob level stuff, right? Yeah. It's the stuff that we all need to embed deep in our psyche if we want to survive on this yeah. journey. Mm -hmm. And I think the final lesson from all of this is the pros aren't always what they seem, yeah. okay? The trader gods didn't end up being gods after all. You got to do your own research. Don't listen to what David and I say. Don't listen to what Suzu says. Do your own research mm -hmm. on this stuff. Yeah, That's yeah. Lesson. There's a, there's a, there's that quote that everyone's an expert in the bull market. So, <laughs> yes. like, it's, it's it's more about being an expert in the bear market. That's the that's where true colors show up. What what is the uh, the fallout reaction from this uh, this interview? Like, it wasn't very favorable. No, there, there's a number the of uh, yeah. The, the block put out an article that that had some reaction takes to this the Bloomberg article. Uh, and so a quote from the block article says: One disgruntled party told the block that they were absolutely disgusted after reading the interview and said, "Stop hiding and deflecting blame and own up to your own mistakes. Cooperate fully with the relevant parties and do not ghost those involved with this." And a second quote from Arthur Hayes, and this is this one's awesome. Arthur Hayes, no stranger to controversy, he's the guy that got charged by the CFTC for operating in BitMEX, was scornful in a thread on Twitter, taking issues with Sue's claim that he wasn't flashy. Come on, y'all. Sue ain't flashy. He rides a bike to work and then to the marina where his super yacht is moored. Only two <laughs> homes. Bruh, you straight summoning it in the Kampong, aka Tanglin. I don't know what these references are. Uh, he rich wrote, people references, I'm, sir. Yeah, rich, yeah, I'm assuming rich, rich neighborhoods in Singapore, maybe. Uh, he wrote, referring to different Singapore neighborhoods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There it is. That's the story. Case closed. That's what we can learn. I hope we can move on from this. And I, I know we will. David. Let's talk about this next item, which is yep. big, Coinbase Insider Trading. And I think there's two pieces to this story. Why don't you tee us up with both those pieces? Yeah, yeah. So the, the first one is just a headline, right? Uh, Coinbase product manager arrested on insider trading charges, you know, kind of more or less the full story. You kind of get it. There's not really too much crazy there. Um, two individual, two brothers profited by $1.5 million in illegal trades on 25 different crypto assets and at least 14 different separate co coin Coinbase public listings. And so the idea here is that Coinbase lists these tokens, these people that know about it ahead of time buy the tokens, and then they sell the tokens after the listing, after the token pump. Uh, Coinbase has been like listing a lot of like just ridiculous tokens lately. Like ones that I don't even think are on Uniswap of all places. Wait, really? Yeah, I, I don't know if that's oh. true, but it's like the, the names of the tokens are like, I, like, uh, what was that? What was that? Right. Uh, let's go Brandon coin. Like, what? Stuff, yeah, <laughs> stuff like this. It's okay. some bad, bad tokens. It's like already questionable. Uh, so like they're kind of digging themselves a hole. But anyways, these two brothers charged with uh, doing illegal trading. Um, but that's like the much smaller side of this story. The much bigger side of the story is that the SEC is charging these two brothers for trading illegal securities. And that's where so much collateral damage comes into this whole entire Wait, are there, there's two charges here. One is like wire fraud, yeah. which is the, like the base charge. Right. But they're also charging them for uh, legal securities? Yes. So the, the SEC is, is claiming that the assets being traded are securities. And so... They're taking these two brothers, I think, and there's also a third person, a friend, uh, and they're taking these people to court for wire fraud wow. and for and for trading secu illegal securities. So what this does, Ryan, is it implicates Coinbase as an illegal securities exchange. It implicates every other exchange that also trades these assets as an illegal securities exchange. It implicates uh, the issuers of these tokens as issuers of unregistered illegal securities. And the worst part about this, Ryan, is you know who the defendants in this case are? These three, bro these two brothers, and this other guy. Oh, so they're, they're picking. They're picking on them. Like I, right. I understand they were they were at fault. There's a mm -hmm. real wire fraud. Yes. Uh, charge here. No one is contesting that. But the SEC is trying to make a broader yes. point, I yes. suppose, in court. Right. 
Yes. And so the, it's like, say these, these people like plead guilty. I think this is the way this works. They, these brothers plead guilty because they don't have the resources to fight the SEC. And the, it, whether or not they, they trade securities is yeah. not their fight. They, they're fighting whether they should go to jail or not over wire fraud. They don't care if they were securities or not. Who does care is Coinbase and the token issuers who aren't defendants. And so since they're not defendants, they can't stick up for themselves because they're not involved in the case. It's ridiculous. It's, it's actually it's, the most spineless move I can think of. Like it's 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 like okay. So yes, wire fraud, front running yeah. bad. Yeah. The thing they did Charge is them. inexcusable. Charge, Charge them. them. Like we have a legal system for a reason. Mm -hmm. Let's use it to its full extent. It's the securities thing that the yeah. SEC is sneaking right. in. Right. That uh, sneaky, implies sneaky, a much Gary more insidious Gensler. agenda. Okay. Let's see what uh, see what Jake Travinsky says. I'll read his, in, his in first a thread. Got more. Um, the SEC alleges in today's complaint that nine digital assets are securities, but don't explain their analysis for even one. Right. They also right. didn't sue the issuers or exchange where the tokens traded, the people with resources to fight back. Right. They just went after one man and his family. Thread reader, it's please. hard to overstate what a mess this will be. The SEC's jurisdiction turns on whether these assets are, in fact, securities. This means the case may require nine mini trials, one for each asset to resolve their security status without the issuers or exchange to defend any. Wow, this is yeah. like a winning on a technicality. Is this yes. what the SEC is trying to do here in order to push its, its um, I guess, regulatory apparatus into controlling more of crypto? Yeah, yeah, it, it's super, super nefarious. Uh, Jake had another great thread, which we'll read here. Um, the SEC filed a complaint yesterday accusing 10 companies of violating the ex securities laws, nine digital asset issuers in one exchange. None of them are the defendants in the case. None of them will get their day in court. And if this isn't regulation by enforcement, then nothing is. Here's a threat. Defendants are three individuals, Coinbase, employee, brother, friend, et cetera. We've already talked about this. Uh, in addition to the SEC suit, SEC suit the DOJ uh, indicted them for criminal wire fraud, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, trying to scroll down, Ryan. Uh, to be clear, I'm not trying to excuse insider trading. Of course, neither are we. That's what we're saying. Uh, the SEC alleges that the defendants committed securities fraud by using material, non-public information to trade ahead of Coinbase listing announcements. To establish jurisdiction, the SEC claims that the assets in question, the nine digital assets, are unregistered securities. As far as I know, the SEC has never addressed these assets before. We've learned the SEC's views on the facts patterns that it believes uh, qual that it believes qualify them as securities for the first time in a federal complaint rather than in guidance or rulemaking. This is regulation by enforcement. It's not uncommon to learn for the first time when an enforcement agency has identified a violation when a complaint is filed, but typically that happens when the agency files an action against the person who they think broke the law. This is different, very different. Here, the SEC isn't just accusing the defendants of breaking the law. The SEC is also accusing 10 unrelated, uncharged companies of breaking the law, nine for failure to register digital asset securities, and one for operating un under an unregistered national securities exchange. Despite leveling accusations against uncharged companies in public, the complaint is devoid of legal analysis. They didn't even give any analysis as to why the tokens are securities. The SEC just makes a few allegations of fact and then similarly, sim similarly concludes that they satisfy Howie, but surely these That's are the Howie test, which Howie is kind test, of the, yeah. the, the legal mm -hmm. court justification for why things are securities mm -hmm. in the US. Yeah. To win, the SEC must prove that one or more of these assets is a security. In a real sense, these companies are on trial too, but the SEC didn't name them as defendants. They are only allowed to defend themselves in court. They are not allowed to defend themselves in court. On principle, this is deeply unfair and unjust. Yes, uh, that's probably a good place to wrap it up. It, it goes on, yeah. Goes on, uh, yeah. You know, there's a lot more to this, but I think I think we kind of get the gist. Um, okay, so that's what's going on. Um, besides the defendants who are in this re like regrettable position of like also trying to defend against uh, the SEC here, um, Coinbase wrote a post right. fighting back here. The title of this blog post is Coinbase does not list securities. End of story. Yeah. This is I mean, by the chief legal officer of Coinbase. The TLDR is Coinbase does not list securities on its platform, period. Yeah. I think the TLDR title. is all we need to read here. Just read the title. Um, yeah. And, and it's and like it, the tone of this is like, hey, SEC, F off. We're not, we're we, not don't know, securities. we don't even know, like, why are you saying right. these are securities? You've provided right. no justification for why. Right. You've given no clarity, despite right. the crypto industry having asked for this for like the last. Yeah. 
seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. And now you're just blanketly uh, saying through right. this enforcement action that certain things are securities or not. Right. I get, my question though is, David, is this, this actually in, in one way sort of a good thing in right. that like the SEC will also have to prove in court that these nine assets are securities. I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. some of them genuinely actually are securities. I right. can't like attest to you, each of them. Right. It's just the principle of like, we have no idea what's a security and not. There's, there's no clarity. We have mm -hmm. absolutely no clarity from the SEC. Right. And they keep pointing to the Howey test, which is like, was it 1930s, 1940s legislation right. about an orange grove has not been adopted for the modern world and certainly not adopted for the world of cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. And they can barely say Bitcoin is not a security. They barely say that. Right. And sometimes they say ETH is not a security. And other times it feels like some of them try to to wheel to that back that a little is. bit yeah, too. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we have absolutely no clarity, even though some of these assets are clearly commodities. Right. And this is what the SEC is doing. And I don't know what the end game is or why they're doing it, David. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think this is just a state, uh, an illustration of what happens when one agency just gets off the rails and tries to do a power grab. Uh, and so the CFTC is playing in this game as well. So they, they release a statement and they release a statement that starts with a quote, which I really love. And the quote is, in the world, words of Federalist Papers number 49, the people are the only legitimate fountain of power. And it is from them that the constitutional ch charter is derived. Government is and should be the servant of the people. And it should be fully accountable to them for the actions which it supposedly takes on their behalf. Uh, and so First the, principles, baby. Yeah. Yes, for, we, yes, we love the first principles thinking. And then they continue, the case SEC versus uh, Wahid, the bro one of the brothers, is a striking example of regulation by informant, uh, enforcement. The SEC complaint alleges of dozens of digital assets, including those that could be described as utility tokens and or certain tokens related to decentralized autonomous networks are securities. The, the fact that the CFTC is making a public statement about the errant nature of, this, of the SEC, that, that's a big deal. Like, well, yeah, this like is a commissioner saying right. basically to the SEC, guys, chill. Chill. Like, chill, just chill, guys. chill Gary. Right. Yeah. Okay, you've gone too far. You're crossing some right. lines here. Mm -hmm. And it's not even clear that this is SEC's jurisdiction, right? Right. I mean, there's some turf war between the CFTC and the mm -hmm. SEC. And the CFTC so far has been much like more pro-market innovation. Right. And not enforcement. Right. Uh, like through, um, through enforcement. Uh, regulation through, through enforcement. enforcement. See, but the actually, problem with that, Ryan, is that like the CFTC is like, okay, like you guys industry, there's some rough edges, but like good job, keep going. Let's see, let's see where this goes. We'll like be relatively hands off. BitMEX, no, no bad. We're going after you. But like for the rest of you guys, like keep going cautiously. Yep. And then the SEC is like, oh, CFTC, you're just like leaving this open for us. We we'll can have it. all of this. We'll take yeah. it. Like we'll take all of this. It's the same reason libertarians never win elections. Right. Right. Yeah. It's just because it's just like the tactics they use of mm -hmm. just, you know, aren't, aren't working. Right. So the, right. the bigger government policy uh, ends up winning. But this is really hurting coin stock. I don't know if you've seen right. this, David, but yeah. uh, Coinbase shares tumbled 21%. And this was right after the report that it's facing an SEC um, probe. I guess what you, right. that's what you call it, being probed by uh, the SEC. Uh, sounds mm -hmm. lovely. Uh, Coinbase valuation, look at this since oh, IPO, brutal. David. That's brutal. Yeah, Down so bad. On the, on, we got a bear the, market here, of course. Sure, but like it, it was, ironically, I, I think when Coinbase IPO'd, yeah, that was the top of the main market. Uh, felt like the top of the market, man. Um, it's kind of funny because I'm bad. like kind that's of bullish bad. Coinbase coin yeah. at these I mean, prices. Right? I, ironically, you know what it takes for it to be especially bullish Coinbase? For the SEC to get just like a leash on it. <laughs> yeah, through the court system. I mean, yeah. how? where else is the leash gonna come? I, it's gotta be know. executive order, which doesn't seem to want to rein that in or the court system. Um, this is interesting as well, related, mm -hmm. unrelated, who knows? Kathy Wood of ARK, she's a Bitcoin uh, bull, of course, ARK Invest. They just sold nearly 1.14 million shares of coin at all time lows of $53 Oof. and their average purchase price was $254. So down a, bad on that trade. Down bad. It's called down bad. Yeah. yeah. I um, I guess like a take as a reminder take here is I feel like a lot of people are trying to solve problems through regulation right now in the Coinbase. Like, so even if you think about the uh, Coinbase insider trading problem, David, mm -hmm. um, 
what if we just allowed everyone to list assets and there was no such thing as front running? Imagine right. that. We don't have to imagine that. That's called Uniswap. Right. The take here is stop trying to solve everything with regulated crypto banks. That's what the Genslers want. <laughs> That's what the Genslers The want. answer to listing uh, front running is Uniswap, where anyone can list. The way to prevent another Celsius is by using Aave, where loans are on chain. We have the solution. It's called DeFi. Mm -hmm. I do think that DeFi doesn't solve everything, right. but it does solve some of these problems here, including right. lack of transparency in a black box. We had the Celsiuses and, and the BlockFi's of the world, and also including Coinbase front running. If you're mm -hmm. listing an asset on Uniswap, anyone can list anytime. There's no insider information whatsoever for an asset listing, and it eliminates the problem completely. You eliminate the need for regulation. That is the model for DeFi, or the regulation mm -hmm. happens on chain, and right. everyone can be a regulator. Anyone can audit this thing at any time. That is the better solution than uh, you know clamping down in a big way. Part, the whole point of labeling something as security is because of a, a information asymmetry. Like if you are the issuer or the manager, then you know things than the buyer does, and yep. that gives you a bunch of power. A lot, not everything. You are you. You just said that DeFi doesn't fix everything, so we're, we're alluding to the same thing. But like DeFi fixes a lot of the information asymmetry, like the majority of it, and it really reduces information asymmetry. So like, sure. Uh, like a, a 10 people could get together, make a DAO, issue a token, and that might be considered a security because you have these issuers. But like, you know, maybe, you know, I don't know, join the Discord, see what they're up to if they if they allow allow that. You can see their behavior on chain. You can on -chain see that cash flows. Like, are, are, right. Basically, they're like um, quarterly statements right. in real time. Right. You can see yeah. revenue. So like a lot of transparency happens when. So even if it's a security, if it's a token on chain, automatically there's so much reduced information asymmetry. So yeah, I don't know. Gensler, well, take it into account, bro. Yeah, what we're saying is there's wins for you, Gary. If, yeah. you, come, if you come to DeFi, look at uh, DeFi. If you get back to base principles of what are we trying to do, right. um, more transparent, fair, orderly, efficient markets, there's some mm -hmm. wins on the DeFi front. And we wish you would see that, yeah. Gary, in the SEC. It makes maybe us one sad. Day. It makes us uh, sad. David, this is not sad, though. Breaking. Some breaking. good news, some breaking news. Uh, what is happening now with the Verge of the Merge? Yeah, the Ethereum developers have announced the merge date for the Gorley testnet. Kind of weird. It's weird to say they announce a merge date and then the date is a range between <laughs> August 6th and 12th. Why but that's because of the way that this works. They have announced the TTD, which is total terminal difficulty, which is basically a metric that is like a re related to the hash power of the Gorley uh, network. Basically, as we get closer, we'll kind of know this date. Between 6th and the 12th, it'll happen. The Gorley testnet is going from proof of, of, of August, uh, which is the last testnet before the merge. Uh, Bankless will be live streaming this uh, and host some ETH stakers, probably Anthony Susano if he wants to come. Whoever wants to, whoever's big in the staking community that wants to come, will host them. Um, we're we're going to live stream this merge. If it all goes well, if it all goes well, Brian, I give it four weeks till merge. Maybe wow. five. Five, maybe six. Maybe six. September. <laughs> September. September. Wow. If it goes well. If it goes September well. September merge. And the others have gone well, I will and say. The others have gone well. They will have, have gone, gone well. They, they have gone well enough to pass that test of going well. Yes, correct. Correct. This is big, yeah. man. This is big. Big. This is Might big. be happening. Guys, big. we're going to um, stream it here, of course. We're going to have lots of merge coverage for you. Mm -hmm. So much that you'd be sick of talking about it. Uh, mm -hmm. But we've got some other Not things me. to cover when we come back. First, POAP and the WNBA. This is a non-speculative crypto use case. Love what Poep is doing here. Secondly, the Uniswap token, there's some fee switch rumblings. They may be turning on the revenue stream. We'll talk about that too and its effect on the larger DeFi token market. But before we do, we wanna thank the sponsors that made this episode possible. Juno is bringing crypto-friendly banking straight into your checking account. With Juno, you can send money from your Juno checking account straight onto a layer two, like Polygon, Optimism, Arbitrum, and they have ZK Sync and StarkNet support on their way. You can skip the ACH wait times, you can skip all the gas fees, and go straight from your checking account to an Ethereum layer two in seconds. Inside Juno, you can buy and sell crypto with $0 fees, and your Juno checking account comes with a metal MasterCard that gives you up to 5% cash back on your spending. Juno is also giving you $10 cash back on your first crypto deposit and hundred dollars when you set up a direct deposit this ad just writes itself so go sign up at juno.finance bankless 
Lens Protocol is an open source tech stack for building decentralized social media applications. It is the new era for social media. We all have toxic relationships with our Web2 apps. We want to break up with them, but we can't. These applications own our digital lives and all the relationships that we've made. We need to break through to a new paradigm of social networking applications that we control rather than them controlling us. Lens isn't a social media app, it's a protocol to let a thousand Web3 social apps bloom. Lens is a permissionless and transparent social graph that is owned by the user. In crypto, we say not your keys, not your crypto. And on Lens, we say not your keys, not your profile. With Lens, your followers go with you to whatever social media application you want to use. And instead of being trapped by an algorithm chosen by that app, Lens lets you you choose the way you want to experience your social media. Lens is the last social media handle that you'll ever need to create. So in order to get started, there is a secret code word in the show notes. Enter that code word in the Google form linked and you'll be well on your way to entering the world of Web3 Social. And we're back with a battle of the ZK EVMs. This was a huge theme during ECC week. Three different teams independently launched their ZK EVM roadmap. Uh, Scroll, Polygon, and ZK Sync. It happened to just be ZK EVM week. Um, Probably, depending on when you're listening to this, I am hosting a live stream with Scroll, Polygon, and ZK Sync today, Friday, if you're listening to this today, 8 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, and so you, it might already have been happen, happening. If, maybe if you're listening to this very early morning, it's about to happen. We are hosting all these teams to talk about their ZK EVM. Uh, but we have three different teams going after the ZK EVM. Ryan, can you explain why we are so bullish on ZKM, ZK EVMs and what the difference is between all of these various ZK EVM yeah, flavors? So we talked about it last week, why ZK EVMs are important. And it's basically because you can get all of the, the goodness and expressivity of the Ethereum main chain only mm-hmm. in a layer two that is you know zk roll up secured and there is this um uh, this term that was bandied about that like pe- like people have still have questions about of evm equivalence what does it mean how do you stack these platforms side by side and i thought this was a great illustration of equivalence so what you're trying to do is everything that you can build and deploy on the ethereum mainnet you want to be able to do the exact same thing have it be mirrored as close as possible to the ethereum mainnet on a ZK, in a ZK EVM world. Mm -hmm. And the different ZK EVM solutions take different approaches to that. If you're to kind of like boil the technical stack into three layers, you have kind of like the the very low level runtime layer. It's where everything is kind of eventually compiled down, all the code that that somebody writes in Solidity is compiled down to to runtime. Above that, you have another layer, the bytecode layer. And then above that, you have the actual language. So in the case of Ethereum on the mainnet, you're, you're uh, programming the language of solidity uh, in almost all cases. And so EVM equivalence and EVM compatibility means some level of the runtime bytecode and language layer mirroring what's happening on mm-hmm. the Ethereum side. So StarkNet basically allows you to do solidity, but then it transforms that into uh, another kind of language that is called Cairo. And then it has its own bytecode layer, it has its own runtime, does not mirror Ethereum closely. Um, ZK Sync is kind of next. Uh, it allows you to uh, write in Solidity, and then it, com- it compiles that down. But like the bytecode and runtime are still different than the Ethereum mainnet. Hermes goes a step farther, and uh, some of the bytecode, like at the kind of the opcode layer, uh, is um, uh, basically the same as Ethereum mainnet. And then Scroll goes the farthest, where it is the most equivalent to Ethereum of all four of the solutions where it gets down to kind of the bytecode layer. uh, And um, the runtime, of course, is uh, the ZK EVM. That's kind of the difference between all of these solutions is Mm. you can sort of transport your your Solidity code. Uh, On StarkNet, you kind of have to learn some Cairo. On ZK Sync, you can sort of port your Solidity code, same with Hermes and Scroll. But with, with Scroll, it has more equivalence to Ethereum at the bytecode right. layer. And these other solutions don't have as much, though they have some. Well done. I'm impressed. Ah, uh, yeah. What, nice job. It's pre- some, someone more technical is just going to be like, all of that was trash. Bad explanation. <laughs> but everyone less technical is be like, oh, wow, thanks, Ryan. He's really smart. <laughs> He's really smart. <laughs> Let's talk about this uh, Hayden yeah. tweet, David. So this is uh-huh. the Uniswap token. It is printing money. Not the token, but the protocol. The protocol. What are we looking the protocol. at? Protocol. Yeah, we're looking at, we've seen this so many times before, but this one is even the biggest, the biggest discrepancy between the Uniswap fees earned through the Uniswap trading fee protocol, $7.5 million in one day 
versus Ethereum's two million dollars. So like Uniswap fees up, Ethereum gas fees down. Um, it's eight, eight, like nine million dollars a day average in daily earned fees for Uniswap liquidity providers, which is just crazy. Uh, I mean, we usually would talk about this in markets, but there's more to the story this time. Uh, so we have, there's a governance proposal about the Uniswap fee switch, not necessarily to turn it on, but it perhaps about a redesign. Uh, so a, a, this thing coming out of a latent QSAC, uh, fee switch design space and next steps. Uh, and he begins saying, there has been a lot of discussion around whether the fee switch should be turned on. This, in most of this discussion, I see an assumption that using this fee, the fee switch equals money going to uni token holders. I think this is limiting. I'm not gonna read out this whole entire proposal, but there's conversations in the Uniswap governance about the fee switch. So like anything at this point would be great. Uh, and anything is happening, something is happening. Uh, there is a, a podcast coming out on Monday about DAO governance and how DAO governance needs to get fixed in order to fix uh, protocol fees. Uh, so that's highly relevant. That is with Hazu, it's one of the best podcasts we've ever recorded. But the fact that Uniswap's printing money, there is a proposal being actively discussed called uh, fee switch design space and next steps. Uh, yeah, this is the, the these fee are the switch signs is you coming. Need to switch. So you're saying you think it might I, be? The, the, it's it's not not coming at the very least. <laughs> we are. Uh, I don't know if we're making steps in the right direction, but we are not making steps in the wrong direction at the very I, least. Look, I think that Hasu episode is uh, is perfect because there is this perception of like. Our, our DeFi protocols, our blue chips are not broken. Like they just handled the recent crash phenomenally well. They're still printing mm -hmm. money from a revenue perspective, but there's right. a perception that the tokens themselves are broken from a value accrual our perspective. Valueless governance tokens has yeah. turned into an actual, not a meme, but actuality. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that's the discussion we have with um, Hasu is how do we fix that? Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty optimistic that we will fix it and fix it this cycle. And we're starting to see that in governance mm -hmm. play out. Uh, anyway, definitely tune into that episode. David, I've had this question of um, whether I, I don't, not many people are talking about it, which maybe means like people aren't going to do it, but like, you know, it could, yeah. I could imagine that um, the chain that gets forked, you know, merge and becomes kind of the, the canonical Ethereum chain with, with proof of stake, right? That, right? that will obviously happen, but someone will probably continue to operate the Ethereum the work chain. chain in a proof yeah. of work environment, like an Ethereum right. classic classic type right. of move. Uh, no, classic cash. Classic, classic cash. cash. Ethereum yeah. is. Oh, is this a thing that's happening? Oh, I, I don't know, but I would imagine. That. <laughs> what else are we going to talk? Well, like uh, it just seems like opportunity. Do you remember? Do you remember yeah. that that time when um, there was like I don't know, fifty different flavors of Bitcoin, like Bitcoin Diamond, Bitcoin Bitcoin Private, Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin yeah, exactly. Cash, Bitcoin Satoshi's Vision. Around the Bitcoin time that ABC. a Bitcoin Cash forked, right. yes, yeah. Satoshi's Vision, uh -huh. all of these things. You could probably append an adjective to Bitcoin, and there was probably a fork of that. Well, it, was like, it, it was it was called the the um, fork and fair launch era, and it was equivalent to our DeFi yield farm era, but for Bitcoin and proof of work. Like 2017 era, is this uh, 2016 to 17, yeah. 2016, mm -hmm. 20. So, do you think anyone's going to do this? Uh, yeah, probably. Like the yeah. miners. I mean, like the the. It just takes a very minimum amount of coordination to coordinate on the new shelling point, which is the proof of work chain that forks off of Ethereum before it goes to proof of stake. Uh, like, why not? Well, and, and the thing is, like, if some people do it, then like traders do it, and if traders do it, then other traders do it, and all of a sudden it becomes a shelling point. I feel like all the people that would have done this are busy with their own chains, though. <laughs> you know, like um, they've already made a Justin Sun. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like you know, he's got Tron. You can't <clears throat> right. fork in it another Ethereum. Uh, sir, you sir, underestimate Justin Sun, sir. <laughs> he could do another. <laughs> Justin, Justin Sun will do whatever he wants if it makes him money. Look, the great news if you are an ETH holder is, of course, you just get this coin too. Yeah. Whether it's valuable I don't think or it's valueless, be that simple. Just get it, sell yeah. it. Free yeah. airdrop, free fork. Yeah, that, that, I will say that that you should sell it. <laughs> You never know, David. I don't know how fast or slow, okay. but eventually you should get rid of it. Okay. Not financial advice, but <laughs> you should definitely sell.
You should have me, so. NFT stuff, David. <laughs> this is pretty cool. Uh, oh, by uh, the way, well, we didn't even finish. Up, we didn't even start that story. This story, this story, this story is was that a different story. Ant Pool, which is a, a proof of work mining farm for Ethereum, supports Ethereum Classic ecosystem with ten million dollar investment. Ethereum Classic is the proof of work Ethereum chain that forked off of Ethereum with a DAO hack. It's the one that has embraced proof of work. Ant Pool, a proof of work miner, has uh, invested ten million dollars to support the Ethereum Classic ecosystem. Makes sense because these people have hefty, hefty financial investment into proof of work. And so they would love it if Ethereum Classic had a vibrant ecosystem so they could they could just like mine that chain and sell those tokens because like you go, I mean, what is the Ethereum Classic market cap, Ryan? It's got to be under uh, a billion, right? I was just right? looking at this. Yeah. What are we? Market what? cap. Oh, wow. Five, five. Wow. Wow, no, that's this is eight point five billion, my friend. Well, yeah, but it's also up forty percent on the day. Oh, it's so like, been appreciating relative to ETH recently. Yeah, well, big people time, are doing this, right? Trade. Yeah, yeah, and so, but, but also this like quarter trillion dollar network, Ethereum, is going to turn like all of the revenue towards proof of work miners off, and then like these miners that are f mining this like you know quarter or two hundred billion dollar network are all going to go and start mining this eight billion dollar network. Uh, and so like margins are going to get real thin. And so these miners are investing in Ethereum Classic because they need to pump up the chain because that's well, their revenue source. Maybe that's, David, maybe maybe that's why there won't be many forks uh, or any forks of a pre-merged Ethereum is because no, be one. Ethereum Classic be one. kind of has that niche already. Yeah, but that. but if you fork off of the most most recent chain, you get a lot of like Maker DeFi, DAO yeah. and all like Compound. All these things are still like the contracts are on Ethereum. Things like Dai will break because the Ether price on the new Ether price will go to like zero or like very very low. Hmm. Like USDC is not going to be honored. A lot of things that are going to be extremely chaotic on that chain. Hmm. But like I don't know, like you can pick something up from the ashes. There you go, for the enterprising young scammer. It's yeah. just uh, yeah. start just, your just long Forks enough for me to sell. Just let me sell. <laughs> there you go. Hey, maybe something could come of it. I we shouldn't be uh, so, so so sure here. So David. yeah, something as in more <laughs> ether for me. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Poap NFT Poap, stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is Roz saying I'm a giga fan of Poap because they found product market fit outside speculation, and this is a tweet. Yeah, a few Poap have done that at in a stadium on the Megatron. Mm -hmm. uh, scan to collect your WNBA NFT. It's mm -hmm. a Poe app, uh, and this is a partnership with the WNBA. Yeah, I have the, heard. the WNBA releases like this, like to do, like what is this? Yeah, and they say we're excited to announce that everyone attending the 2022 oh, cool. WNBA Commissioner's Cup Championship, presented by Coinbase on July 26, will have the opportunity to mint a free collectible NFT called a Poe app. This is the first ever WNBA issued NFT, and it serves as a digital proof that you attended the game, kind of like a ticket stub or souvenir. Cool, cool. That's very nice. uh, good exp explanation of what a PO app is, actually. Yeah, right? Yeah. Good job, yeah. guys. And job. that's exactly what a PO app is. Mm -hmm. um, this is the PO app itself on PO. Wow, it's pretty. Dot gallery. Yeah, it looks great. And I think about... 84. Uh, 84 yeah. people. No, no, no. Um, seven, uh, apparently 700 people or so inputted their emails. They're still, oh. you know, we're st yes. we'll start working it. Something like this. And, uh, you know, but these are new people entering right. the crypto world that previously mm -hmm. wouldn't have. And these are definitely um, more, more the normie side, right? This Certainly, is not a yeah. speculative yeah. asset use case. It's nothing DeFi. Mm -hmm. right. I guess it's NFTs, but all you had to do was show up to a game, to an event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I love that. Yeah. So like uh, 84 people got them. So 84 people have pulled out their phone, scanned their QR code, and had a mobile wallet to collect that PO app. Oh. 84 people at a WNBA game had... A mobile wallet. That's kind of cool. Go. Um, let's talk about this, David. There's a bill before Congress. Bipartisan bill seeks to eliminate taxes on crypto transactions under fifty dollars. <laughs> if I wah, had one of those wah. kazoo things, I'd be like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, cool, but just under fifty dollars. That's $50? all. Fifty dollars, like five hundred dollars. Yeah, or come something. on, five hundred, please, please. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but um, th these are some of the. That's not even people. dinner. Like if I have to pay somebody back for dinner, it's like over fifty dollars, <laughs> right? I mean, I guess this is gas fees, maybe sometimes, most yeah. of the time on Ethereum. Yeah. But I guess so. Yeah, more. that'd be nice. That'd be nice. Some progress. I don't know. It's something. We have to see if that goes you know, anywhere. You, do you know that it's something meme? Yeah. It's something. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that meme, but yes, oh, really? <laughs> I, I see it now. Uh, <laughs> other news: Solana 
has physical store stores now. Mm-hmm. It's like the Apple store. There is a Solana store. Mm-hmm. Looks like in the background there's some t-shirts. Looks like there's a t-shirts. shoe over there. Yeah, what is that? Uh, there's some NFT uh, frames as well. Um, okay. I can say anything more about this, you know? It's, okay. Solana's got a store. Solana's got a store. Is it open 24 seven or is it close? Where is this store? <laughs> I would kind of like to visit, actually. Come on, that was a funny Show joke. Picture. What'd you say? <laughs> is it open 24-7 or is it close? <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> Great. Uh, edit that. Delete that. We're going to YouTube <laughs> don't, comments. Don't do, that. don't do that. That was a good joke. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, Chipotle, buy the dip promo, includes $200,000 in crypto for customers' Coinbase accounts. The restaurant chain is also giving away $2 million in guacamole and queso to celebrate National Avocado Day. Oh, God, it's a bear market. God, next, 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 You wanted next. to include this, David, so you have to live with it. Now tell us why this is significant for a roll-up, sir. Oh, Coin- Chipotle has adopted crypto. <laughs> Bullish next, guacamole. Please. Next. next, please. Oh, it's oh, the it's, same story it again. <laughs> <laughs> Too introducing, much fun. introducing Web3 subscriptions coming out of Mirror. This is a real announcement. We're back to being totally serious. Mirror says that they are excited to announce the launch of Web3 subscriptions. This new feature allows readers to subscribe to any Mirror publication with their wallets and receive email notifications when content is posted. For creators, Web3 subscriptions open the door to building a wallet-based community as opposed to an email-based community that can be used across Web3. Uh, so basically, rather than using your email and password, you use your Ethereum wallet. Uh, uh, and a big headline, big like line that they title a paragraph is the future of community is wallet native. Big fans of that. Big fans big of that. Big fan. I like, I really like Love what Mirror is doing. It's like Mirror the Substack killer. I don't 100%. know. They're making some progress. This is all yeah. about winning the hearts and minds of the creator community. And I think that's right. better done with NFTs. Uh, David, we, what's this? As previous Substack customers, we would know. Uh, wallet current, Connect. And current, <laughs> sir. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oopsies. Don't jump the gun. <laughs> uh, Wallet Connect. Say hello to the future of chat with Wallet Connect chat. You can DM any user using any wallet on any chain. So Wallet Connect releasing a chat feature. Uh, cool. Nice. Nice. Uh, next. I like this. I want to oh, do it. Nice. I just don't know who to do it with, David. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, we have like, we chat on Discord, right? Or I'd, yeah, we chat like, on Discord. Yeah. Chat you up. Yeah. But. Uh, Okay, Ryan, you want to take this one? You should take this one. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, This is Raises. So we're talking about Raises. So Aptos is a a layer one chain that just raised $150 million from FTX, Jump Crypto, and more, and friends. Um, I think Aptos was the um, former people involved with the DM project, the Novi project at Ah, Facebook. Yeah, so Aptos consists of the leaders, engineers, and strategic talent behind years of development at DM and Novi. You remember when um, DM was like a big thing? And in 2018, it was the blockchain that was going to come eat Ethereum and all of the other smart contract chains. It's called DM. It's best engineers in the game. They were at Facebook, and they developed this, uh, not Solidity, this programming language called Move. Well, it's back. Now it's called Aptos. And I've actually heard in the developer community some some rumblings that Move is kind of cool, kind of works mm-hmm. better in, in some ways maybe than Solidity. Um, that I've heard does not before. say much for the Aptos chain. I'm not sure about that, but the same tech. And it kind of begs the question. It's like you look at some of the investors here, FTX and Jump Crypto. Besides Aptos, there's another chain that's similar to this that also uses Move rather than Solidity. It's called Sue. And so is this the rise, David, of the ETH killer killers? Hmm. Question mark? Is hmm. this a Solana killer? Around is, the roller coaster we go. Yeah, it's Another interesting. And in the come. set of investors, of course, are um, the typical investors who funded other layer ones in the past. Um, the skeptic take here is rotator is going to rotate right. and we get a new crop of alt layer ones every single cycle. And here's another one. Yeah. Um, I guess the more optimistic take is awesome, more funding. Uh, move is potentially a really cool technology. Who knows what these blockchains can bring to the table, doing more experiments, getting more funding for these experiments as well. What's your personal take, my friend? Um, I don't know how to differentiate it other than the backstory of Facebook. I'll wait until I see a community. There you go. What a, what a reasoned, uh, rational take from my co-host here. Um, also, I'm just exhausted, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> you, are you hot in there? Do you have the AC off? No, I'm exhausted of all of all the uh, all the ones. <laughs> okay. I thought you were exhausted because we just did like a three-hour podcast with Bellagio this morning. 
We do a lot of <laughs> podcasts, guys. Uh, yeah. Unstoppable domains, they just reached unicorn status after their latest raise. So over a billion dollars, that's what unicorn means. A $65 yeah. million dollar Series A. I don't, how does Unstoppable Domains make money? They I sell feel like domains, they've gotten, sir. They've gotten drowned out by ENS. No, nah, they sell domains. It's a good business model. Dot crypto. I have a dot crypto. I did not purchase okay. it, but I have one. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about you jobs. You didn't give them money. <laughs> Bank, Bankless Jobs Board. A uh, few cool jobs, of course, as always. This is your reminder to what, mm -hmm. David? What do they need to do? Get a job in crypto. It's, yes. Do you listen to how much fun me and Ryan have? I mean, I, Bankless probably has the most amount of fun out no, of any don't company. Say that. Everything's like what? this. We do. Okay. I mean, we. I'm, I'm just. We have a lot of fun. We want you to get I a mean, job. Other other companies, <laughs> other companies also have fun. Yes. Um, and so you should get a job in crypto because they are probably more fun than your Boomer Web Two TradFi job. Oh, there's also some Bankless jobs. Alpha. Oh wow! Also. I wonder why I was talking about you how fun it is fun. to work at Bankless. But first. <laughs> Vertex Protocol, a marketing coordinator. That's non-technical. Uh, Bankless UX UI designer. That's non-technical. Senior newsletter editor. We are looking for that. It's literally the best job on the market. Also non-technical. Really hard to do, but if you got it, you got it. Yeah, Streams. Got it, yeah. It's looking for a financial analyst. Steakfish. I think is smart that wait is that is that non-technical? That's financial definitely non-technical. That's non-technical. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, Steakfish. Smart contract software engineer. Steakfish. Backend engineer. Steakfish. Blockchain technical. marketer. That's on technical. Steakfish, front end software engineer, Steakfish uh, DevOps technical. engineer, Bankless Academy, product Ooh. manager. Don't know what that is, but it's definitely not technical. Uh, Bankless Academy, I know what that is. Up and coming. I mean, I do know what that is, but I don't know what they're awesome. up to. Guys, there's so much for you there. Uh, go follow the Bankless Jobs Board at bankless.palette.com. Make sure you plug in your email. You'll get these updates via email when they come up. Mm. You'll know what the jobs mm. are. David, DevCon's coming up too. Yes. You should do a quick PSA for DevCon. What's DevCon mm. about? And uh, what's some of the alpha around DevCon? Yeah, so it's a little bit like Dev Connect that we did back in Amsterdam. Amsterdam was the first Dev Connect. DevCon, this will be the seventh? No, sixth. Sixth DevCon. This one is held all over the world. Uh, if I was on my game, I would be able to list off every previous city that DevCon's ever been to. Even though, Ryan, I have been to zero of them, and I'm very bummed about that. But I will be going to DevCon number six. Uh, so DevCon ticket sales are underway. They are released in tranches. Uh, you can get your tickets at DevCon.com slash EN for English slash tickets or DevCon.org. Oh, did I say .com? .org. DevCon.org uh, for your tickets. It's in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, some people got a little bit turned off by like, is that safe? Colombia is scary. Look, everyone's Look, asking, is it safe, uh, David? Vital if Vitalik's going, I'm going, and I'm gonna go anyways, even if he doesn't Looks go. Looks beautiful. I'm definitely going. Uh, like, yo, there Look are hotels and stuff. It's fine, it's fine. Um, yeah, uh, it's gonna be great. Uh, it's happening in October, like 11th through 14th of October. Uh, so I will certainly be going, uh, which is, uh, yeah, I'm very excited. There is very also excited. a special discount for um, students, builders, mm -hmm. uh, and, and particular students from Latin America. So we'll include a mm -hmm. link to uh, where you can find that as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. David, we had some hot stuff coming up next, including questions for you and I from the nation, including questions is nation. ETH a, Ve a Veblen good? Question yeah, mark. I love this question. What this is a Veblen question. good? Another question. What's Ryan and David's life like when they're not working? Does that even <laughs> <What>? exist? <laughs> who, who let that question in? <laughs> hot takes from Crypto Twitter. Of course, we got a few hot takes for you as well. We'll be right back. But before we get there, we want to tell you about these fantastic sponsors that make Bankless possible. ZK Sync is an Ethereum layer two network that is pushing the frontier of high performance blockchains that don't compromise on security or decentralization. ZK Sync has combined the power of zero knowledge rollups in the Ethereum virtual machine, enabling developers to build the greatest Web3 projects possible, ones we haven't even seen yet. Crypto needs its killer applications to onboard the world, but crypto killer apps need ZK Sync as a platform to build on first. It's generally accepted that zero knowledge rollups are the conclusion of crypto blockchain scaling technology, and ZK Sync is leading the charge into the final frontier of crypto economics. So if you're a developer who wants to build your app on a future-proof foundation, which gives your users the best UX possible, check out ZK Sync's website at zksync.io. And yes, there's also going to be a token, so give them a follow on Twitter too, at zksync. 
Rocket Pool is your decentralized Ethereum staking protocol. You can stake your ETH in Rocket Pool and get our ETH in return, allowing you to stake your ETH and use it in DeFi at the same time. You can get 4% on your ETH by staking it with Rocket Pool, but you can get even more by running a node. Rocket Pool is the only staking provider that allows anyone to permissionlessly join their network of validating Ethereum nodes. Setting up your Rocket Pool node is easier than running a node solo, and you only need 16 ETH to get started. You get an extra 15% staking commission on the pooled ETH that uses your your node to stake. You also get RPL token rewards on top. So if you're bullish ETH staking, you can boost your yield by adding your node to the decentralized Rocket Pool network, which currently has over 1,000 independent node operators. It's yield farming, but with Ethereum nodes. You can get started at rocketpool.net, and you can also join the Rocket Pool community in their Discord. You can find me hanging out there sometimes in the chat, so I'll see you there. Hey guys, we are back starting with the questions for the nation. As a reminder, if you have a question for Dave and myself for the roll-up, get it in. Go follow us on Twitter. That's Bankless HQ on Twitter. If you have a question for the roll up, we're throwing a thread out there every Wednesday and just add your question to the list. The first here this week is from mymoneyplan.ch. Is ETH a kind of Veblen good? That is a good that's demand increases as its price increases, like designer handbags, the Gucci, the Prada, that sort of thing. Is ETH a Veblen good? David, what do you say? Ryan, the answer is unequivocally. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. And we have two ways of answering this question. One, we can just kind of reason about this. Um, Ether, the yield, the real, real world yield, as in like what you can buy with Ether yields, uh, goes up when Ether price goes up, right? And so, but not, uh, how am I trying to say this? Okay, so 32 Ether gets you like 5 to 7% yield at like $1,000 price, it'll still get you a five to 7% ETH nominated yield at $1,000 or $10,000 or $100,000. So the yield does not go down in real terms as the price goes up, which makes it desirable as price goes up because the, the yield is always the same. Uh, we have also can see this in uh, this, the transactional volume of this thing, whereas we've, so we were talking about today, Ryan, where the, the volume of uh, gas markets or the, the Gray prices super low because it's a bear market. But it, when it was a bull market, we had 40, 400, 500, 600 sustained gray gas prices for weeks because as like as the economy heats up on Ethereum, more transactions happen on Ethereum, more Ether gets burnt, more yield goes to stakers. And so as Ether price goes up because the bull market is on, the yields go up, the ETH burn goes up, and the price goes up. And so this turns into a positive feedback loop, which is exactly what a Veblen good is. So this thing actually perpetuates itself forward. Now, it doesn't do that in a short time frame. It does it over like 10, 20 year long horizons. And so this like self-perpetuating bull market, I think will take a long time to play out. But yes, thing, this thing is a Veblen good, you also it also gets more liquid as the price goes up. That's like a normal property of all assets, but it's especially true of of ether because it has its own native liquidity inside of things like Uniswap and Balancer and like all these exchanges. And so, Ethereum provides ether its own liquidity, which scales with price. Uh, it provides uh, increasing yields as price goes up. So price goes up, but yields increase faster in real terms, not in ETH terms, in real terms. And so is ETH a kind of Veblen good? Does it get more demand as price goes up? The answer, Ryan, is yes. Yes, it does. There it is all along. ETH wasn't luxury. It wasn't ultrasound money. It was luxury money <laughs> luxury. all along. <laughs> that is a the, terrible branding. The Prada of money. Prada. The Gucci of money, sir. I do not subscribe to this A branch. Veblen good. That's what you just said, David. <laughs> I quoted you directly. Let's go to the second question. How does your day, week normally look like in terms of uh, work outside of the hours you record? Would love to know how you guys go about your days. Hmm. Oh, Why don't boy, I pull no. up the bankless calendar, David, and see <laughs> no. if there are any hours that you are not recording this week? <laughs> because I think you might be recording during more daytime hours than you're not recording, sir. Oh yeah, yeah. Very that, close. Th this this week was special. Uh, this week was a, I did a lot of podcasts this week. Um, well, why don't well, you answer? What, when you're not recording, what are you doing? Th th this week has been so far wake up at like uh, seven in the morning and then and then kind of clock out at like 7 p.m., go get dinner and then come back and write a little bit more for like an hour. Uh, it's for the, this week has been uh, like uh, only bank. It's been kind of insane. What is, what is it like normally? It's uh, that wake up at seven. Maybe I clock out at like five, go to the gym, go get a dinner with a friend, 
<laughs> and then I come back and start writing more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily think that I have a healthy work life <laughs> See how fun this is, guys? This is crypto. Well, look, man, when it's a hobby... Get a job in crypto, guys. It's also your job. It's kind of hard to, like, separate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a a similar schedule to you. It's like, I Mm -hmm. wake up at, like, 6.30, 7.30. I spend some time with the family. Um, I have kids. I have a puppy, a dog. Mm -hmm. I do all of my family stuff. And then I get into bankless. I'm usually, like, trying to catch up on what happened the previous day. Yeah. is sort of where my day starts. So that's, like, email... Twitter, Discord, Telegram, like digesting yeah. massive amounts of, of information and data and like sorting it, putting it in different places. I, I do all those same steps except I skip email, but then I get Discord messages yeah, from Ryan do. saying, see email. <laughs> see email or I will screen, I will literally screenshot David an email. Force like, me to check my email. <laughs> show this to you. Here you go. <laughs> and as I just described it, like information sorting, I'm like, oh my God, am I an AI? That was like, <laughs> is this what I do? I digest information. I sort it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I do that for a while. And then, uh, man, we have so much going on at Bankless. If it's not the podcast, it's mm-hmm. um, look at the newsletter, trying to improve mm-hmm. the, the product. Uh, we're launching a new website. We've got some other initiatives, some member initiatives right. that we're doing, and we have a hang team on, of. Hang like, on, we have to stop talking about Bankless. What he says, uh, Fuma says, would love to know what you guys do. Oh about my your god, day. I misread it. Outside yeah. your work hours? <laughs> yeah, so outside of work hours, and not not no, how no, no. we work. <laughs> Sir, so this is outside uh, of the hours you record. So I was oh, getting to the other okay, non-recording okay, hours. Okay, yes, I yes, guess. Yes, okay, yes, so okay. in terms of hobbies and such. My hobby is also crypto and DeFi and like philosophy and economics and history and all of the things that mm-hmm. crypto touches. So it's all it's all kind of one and the same. I am a I guess I love to read books. Yeah. I'm a, reading a book on kind of um, you know you know there's mm-hmm. a new Christopher Nolan movie coming out oh, called yeah, Oppenheimer. Yeah. Uh huh. Are you Ooh, a Christopher that, Nolan fan, by the way? Yeah, oh, certainly. Have you ever talked about this? Yeah, okay. Uh-huh. So Oppenheimer is coming out, and I just recently started reading a book called The Making of the Atomic Bomb. That sounds great. It's, it is great, David. Great. Yeah. Are you making fun of me? Um, no, no, that's a really interesting period. Like, with, like United States, like we we kicked Germany's ass, and then we stole all their rocket scientists, and oh, then but, and then we started making rockets. And the great. book starts cool. before that. It starts right. with kind of the scientists who mm-hmm. actually discovered the physical property of a thing that hypothetically existed, but they didn't right. actually know existed, called yeah. the. The atom, the, the freaking atom. atom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And once you discovered that existed, then everyone's like, well, what do we do with it? Mm-hmm. And some brilliant scientists were like, we can harness the energy of the sun from this thing, <laughs> both for good. Like, it's just fascinating. And so it's all of these scientists. Imagine who saying discover- that line in like the late 40s. We can harness the energy of the sun. <laughs> it's, look, it's the atomic era for a re- reason. Anyway, I do stuff like this. I go uh-huh. on historical tangents. Mm-hmm. I listen to podcasts, yeah. uh, spend time with my family. Um, that's my life, man. You, you exercise, and right? Wash, you, repeat. you used to have exercise on your calendar in the morning, right? I used to. Used I haven't to. gotten to it, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've actually I really been, to... I, since coming back from uh, ECC, I've actually gotten into it. I got, I got some sore glutes. Are you glutes lifting? Right. I got some sore glutes right now. Yeah. You know, I used to lift, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Like, yeah, you're a big deadlifter. Right? Heavy as you, but like, mm-hmm. yeah, I have not lifted in yeah. like two years. Yeah. It's been bad. Yeah. yeah. I need to get back into this bank. Right. Yeah. I need to do this. Oh, okay. I, I also need to redeem myself because I said like, like made it seem like I eat food and, and uh, do bank yeah. stuff. And sometimes I skip the food stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, I thoroughly enjoy rock climbing. So there's a rock climbing gym not too far away. So, you, so I'm, I'm, I'm often there. Um, uh, also big, big smoke saminer. I don't know. I, I was going to say smoker. Didn't know but, that. But that doesn't, uh, doesn't land so well. No, uh, yeah, smoker is different. I smoke some real good salmon, Ryan. Really? You have, you have never had my smoked salmon. But yeah, you can ask my San Diego friends, the alfalfa boys. Do you, can you it, smoke it, that? Like, in your, this might be a stu- super noob question. Like, in your apartment? Do you no, have a way you, to do you, this? you cannot smoke stuff. In <laughs> I was, was going to so, say, right? Yeah, so this was back in San Diego. But I've, okay. there, so like, I've got this fire escape. And you are not <laughs> you are not supposed to put things on your fire escape at all. Um, yeah. But like it's right next to my window, and so I'm thinking about getting one of these like green eggs because they come in various sizes. Yeah. Like, famous green egg smokers get the yeah. medium size and just like <laughs> carry it through Plenty. the window. Just share some the with the rest escape. of the apartment, and no one will right. complain. It'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. All right, we we still have one more question then. Okay. Cool. Uh, very important question: Is Bankless doing a merge watch party, and how do I get an invite? We are going to be a part of a merge watch party. We will not be hosting the merge watch party. The actual merge watch party will be done by the Ethereum Foundation on the Ethereum Foundation YouTube. And me and Ryan will be there, or at least I will. Uh, and But it will be the Gorley 
test net that we will be ho- housing a watch party, hosting a watch party. Did you just say at least I will? Dude, I'm not missing the merge live event. Are you kidding me? I'm just I don't volunteer. It's virtual, your right? Time. I don't have to appear in person. You know yeah, I'm going to be true. there. Yeah, you can pre-record yourself and put it, put it in. <laughs> Guys, that's that's going to be really exciting. How do I yeah. get an invite? Invite will be available. Everyone it's can on come. YouTube. It'll I hope be on YouTube. Yeah. The entire mm-hmm. crypto community comes. This is the biggest event in crypto mm-hmm. I I think since the launch of Ethereum. Before that, it's probably the launch of Bitcoin. This is like the third biggest event to ever happen in crypto. Are we overhyping this, sir? Let's get to takes. No, no, it's no, the biggest event. It it's still. the biggest event in crypto since the launch of Ethereum. What's uh, what's this take from Kronk? Kronk. Uh, CT sentiment, crypto Twitter sentiment. In November 2021, we're all going to be billionaires in this super cycle. <laughs> July 2022, Germans will have to eat their own cats this winter to survive. <laughs> oh, oh wow, that was dark. <laughs> it's a little dark, but you know, crypto sentiment runs uh, real hot and then real cold. Real, yeah, right. And, and it's ge- been real cold lately. Generally counter tradable? Question mark. No, oh, good question. Sometimes. Um, sometimes. You got a hot take though. Should, I how about take. I read this? It's a hot take sure. from David Hoffman. Uh, number one, the 2017 bull market was Ethereum driven. Explanation: Bitcoin had its own story, but it was the ICO mania at the center stage. That wasn't the hot take. That was the lead up to the hot take. That was the lead up. Okay, we're still building. Number two, the 2000, uh, the 2020 to 2021 bull market was clearly Ethereum driven. DeFi, NFTs, gaming. Number three, the next bull market will be three three bull three, markets. Three out of three. Three out of three bull markets led by Ethereum. The bottom line: Ethereum leads. Rocket. Send that tweet to the moon. We're not. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. Wait, no, was that, that, that was not the hot. That was not the hot take. We got two more takes. Oh, I this didn't is, know this. this. Is a three okay. for three for one package. Sorry, Rocky I'm back. ruining David's incredibly hot take here. Uh, the third Ethereum bull market will be a fees based bull market. The merch will allow Ethereum fees to actually move ETH price. Uniswap, Synthetics, MKR, and all the fee commanding tokens will also lead. The next bull market is based on fees. The third tweet. Here. Here's the hot take. Okay. Here's the hot take. We're just building. Okay, now you ready for it? <laughs> yeah. Bitcoin's unsustainable security budget is actually not going to be a issue for like 20 years. As ETH goes through a 20-year bull market, it helps Bitcoin, it helps support Bitcoin price along the way. There, that was the hot take. You actually said that in the tweet. <laughs> All right, so it ended with uh, basically the sun grows up Mm-hmm. And supports the father. Yep. You know? Yep. Yep. That's yeah, the what's, what's that meme of like the uh, the mutant ninja turtles who are like being taught by the dojo person and then and then the dojo person personnel and then the mutant ninja turtles are super strong. I I you I'm, know the Star Trek meme. I I see the Star Trek meme of like, are we friends? And the one oh, yeah. Star Trek guy goes no. Well, the others say yes at the same time. Yeah. I've been kind of mean to Bitcoin in this episode. That's Bitcoin saying no, we're not friends, and Ethereum yeah. saying yes, we are. Um, <laughs> Okay, this, this isn't a take, but I thought this was pretty cool, so I just put it in, put it in here. This is Tim Bako. Uh, he goes, first time here, here being the Seattle, Washington NFT Museum, and I'm impressed. Beyond the art, the museum also has a mainnet miner and proof-of-stake testnet running. Uh, so there's this NFT museum in Seattle, probably why this has showed up on my radar, because Seattle's my hometown. Uh, but also, what we're seeing on screen here is what, that one specifically, is like this uh, uh, nano pools mining software. And Ryan, this was like the beginning of the first like nine months of my life was like staring at this screen watching my miners like mine mine ether and like if you zoom if you zoom in you see these little like green words that say like uh you know unit confirmed and you're like boo i got one nice <laughs> yay wow what a what a great date idea take your uh perspective uh date to the nerd museum in <laughs> seattle <laughs> here at the nft museum and watch live proof of stake uh-huh. command line uh all right vitalik he had a great update at ETHCC. I watched the video. It's about 45 minutes long. Completely worth it. An update yeah. on the Ethereum roadmap. We, we pulled out um, two slides here. And I think uh, the big question here, there's much more in his full presentation. But the big question I think people have, me included, is what percentage of Ethereum are we complete? Right? Mm-hmm. And so Vitalik has given the line before that the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum is Bitcoin is 80% complete and Ethereum is about 40% complete. That's a big difference between yeah. the communities. Um, he actually said from his perspective about the Ethereum roadmap that we are 55% complete once we finish the merge. So just over halfway complete. Right. Uh, I want to ask you, David. So first, first of all, that, that number, 55%. Does that feel about right to you? What would you have said about completion? 
And so when we did our roadmap episode with Vitalik, he talked about there's like all this extra stuff that there's a chance that we just don't have the time to get it into Ethereum before this thing settles. And this thing, this, his talk at ECC is about Ethereum settling down, uh, saying like, we're about to go through this period of rapid change with the merge. After that, we need to let things like stabilize. Um, but like, there's a lot of things in the Ethereum roadmap that like are kind of far out there. Um, and we might not actually get to it before we like learn or accidentally unlearn how to coordinate, which is a feature, not a bug. Like eventually these things, these blockchains need to calcify. So I think when Vitalik says that post-merge we're at 55% done, he's accounting for if we did absolutely everything on the Ethereum roadmap and we never really calcified before we like were unable to get some of the last remaining things on. Um, and so I think that's that 55% measurement. What, uh, what are we looking at here? Because this chart, right. I think, mm -hmm. tells a story here. Right. And uh, describe the axis yeah. for us and the shape of this uh, line here. Yeah, so we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing an S curve, right? And uh, the vertical axis is the capability of the system. So as we go higher, the capability goes up. And then the, uh, the horizontal axis is, of course, time. And then we have this we are here. And where we are is like right before the steepest part of the S. So we are on what Vitalik is saying is with the merge, we are on the cusp of the most, the period of the most rapid change. A lot and of things are going to capability. And, and yes, and, and increasing capability, like, yes. Um, like blockchains aren't necessarily supposed to go through rapid change. So this is a compromise that we're making because we know that we can make a more performant system, higher capabilities, of course. But then what he's, he's saying is like, okay, we're about to go through the merge. Uh, and like, that's going to change a bunch of things after that. Like, yo, we need to chill. We need to let things like steep a little bit. Like we need to, we can focus on some other things other than the protocol. Also the developers need to break. Uh, so like, we we're gonna go through this period of rapid change, and then we're gonna chill. Now but he's also chill. saying he's also saying that uh, over time, you know, the big criticism of Ethereum is so it's always changing. It's like right. that's only the case right now. It is right. eventually the S curve kind of like curves down, and it stops. It ossifies mm -hmm. to a right. certain level of capability, and even in this chart. Not the say, X curve, the, not not the same S curve. The curve of the complexity of the system. So the this, the chart that we were talking about previously was the capability, and then this next chart that we're now going to look at is the complexity, the complexity of the system. Yes. And so the we Good are point. here is we are right up to the point of maximum complexity. We're about to go into maximum complexity, and so what Vitalik's saying is once we get to that point of maximum complexity, we should start becoming less complex, not more. Complex. Removing things. Removing, removing extraneous things. things. Yeah. He actually which gives is, example which is the, in the, the, in the purge, presentation. Yeah. In the whole like purge, purge, merge, whatever thing. Yeah, exactly. Purge. Mm -hmm. The great purge. The great Ethereum purge. I'm here for Purging. it. David, those are the takes. What are you bullish on this week? You know, Ryan, you know how I recorded a bunch of podcasts this week? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, I'm bullish on all the podcasts I record. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite? You have to just name one that you no, recorded No, I have so three. Far. I have three. Um, what are your three favorites? Uh, so you know the cypherpunk t-shirts that we that we made out of the bankless DAO? Oh yeah. I interviewed one of the names that's on the cypherpunk shirt. David Chom. Chom. David Chom coming on the podcast. Uh, so that that was just an honor. The we we stand this crypto industry stands on the shoulders of giants. Uh, and I got to interview one. Uh, so that's coming out. Uh, I also did this pod the food podcast. The food podcast <laughs> I've been talking about. Uh, yes. not what you expect. But the cool thing about it is we use very similar words like uh, anti-fragility and uh, like the decentralization of our food supply and did how you, like did you crypto pill this nutritionist or was he he's already crypto pilled oh really yeah he's already crypto pilled so he like he leaned into this with me and he's like oh. we like we have a debt to pay to our soil because we have not been like reintroducing a nutrients back debt into to our pay to our debt. soil yes dude and so like wait he's like, we okay, had, we've had fiat soil this whole time we've had, we're, we've had fiat soil <laughs> and like now we need to like change our far because we have been borrowing and pulling out nutrients nutrients from our soil, leaving it empty, and we need to put nutrients back into it. We need to start saving nutrients more than we are borrowing nutrients. This is some Safadine Amus type level stuff here, David. Dude, it was really, really, no, but it's really, really good. Uh, okay. Safadine Amus is like, he's acceptable <laughs> okay. at the best. Um, but like, we have to have this soft landing, if you will, of how we change the way we produce our food, or else if we don't, we're going to like overreach and then crash. Like, these are the same principles of decentralization, anti-fragility, like savings and debt, but we apply all of these same words that we've been using in crypto to like this food crisis that's coming. It's like, it's, it's one thing when like we have a crisis in financial markets, Ryan, because we can just kind of print money. You can't print food. 
like what happens as a result of that is people starve. And so I actually, this was one of, it's a really good podcast from a content perspective, but Ryan, it's also one of the, like, I think one of the most pub important podcasts that I've ever created uh, because of like how important this information is. You, you have my attention, sir. I will be listening yeah. to this please, one. Please, uh, please listen. Please uh, listen. What else and you number, got? number three is all the ECC videos of the ECC interview with Vitalik, 30 minutes long. That's out. Kane Warwick is out. Uh, I talked to Kane about, uh, I think I teased this last week. I talked to Kane about his fight with Suzu. Uh, just talked to a bunch of so A lot of this content, by the way, is mm -hmm. coming on YouTube. All right. Yes. But special thing for mm -hmm. people listening to the podcast primarily, we are doing a massive content dump mm -hmm. on Saturday where we're mm -hmm. releasing all, is it seven or eight of these ECC eight. episodes? Eight, yeah. All at once. All at once. That's a, just uh, a fun eight, experience. Eight hours, but broken up into eight different episodes. So yeah. you can you know pick and choose as you see fit. Yeah, get, get mm -hmm. the full ETH experiment, right? So you could listen yeah. to six out of eight or you know listen to all mm -hmm. eight, listen to all listen eight all twice. Eight. Listen, listen Definitely to all eight. Definitely listen to all eight. Yeah, yeah. They're Definitely all add, add reduced. Add reduced. <laughs> you went from six <laughs> minutes down to like less than two minutes. So you're welcome. Awesome. Uh, Ryan, what are you bullish on? Uh, what am I bullish on? You know what? Uh, DeFi tokens. Okay, so the Hasu podcast that mm -hmm. we are releasing on Monday, the theme of that episode was supposed to be um, how we fix DeFi tokens. But the actual content was a bit more bearish and right. turned into a question of can we fix DeFi sure. tokens? And the truth is Hasu wasn't 100% sold that we could. And yet, as we had this discussion about all of the flaws with DeFi token accrual mechanisms right now and the regulatory landscape that um, exists, the difficulties, by the end of that episode, David, I was more bullish because yeah. I see these, all of the difficulties that we outlined, though they are um, large, are also surmountable. Right. Like it's, these are problems that can be solved We've solved them before in humanity. Exactly. And so I left that episode more bullish on DeFi tokens, particularly at their current values. When you see like mm -hmm. the Uniswap, we were talking about that case, how much money it's printing. David, I was just running the math and 70, 78 uh, million dollars a day. Was that what it was? Something 7. like 8, that. 7.8. Uh, what was it per day? Seven point eight million dollars a day. Seven point eight million dollars a day. So what is that? Um, Seven point eight million dollars. 400 and uh wait wait 46 so I'll, I'll, 50 million a year is what that amounts to is that it no no it's 2.9 billion <laughs> 2.9 billion a year is seven, it seven seven point eight times three six five is 2.85 oh billion. yes of course yes sorry i was multiplying that only by six not 365 2.8 billion dollars where the fuck did you year. get six from i don't know why the six was in my calculator instead uh, <laughs> proof of humanity right here. I can't calculate everything. Um, so $2.8 billion. Mm -hmm. And like, that's just one protocol. And right. anyway, I am, I am bullish on DeFi token in the future. I think the problems ahead of us from a governance perspective are completely solvable. Um, I think regulatory is an issue. It's an obstacle. But actually, the constraints that regulatory have given us, I mean, we're growing in a different way, in a different direction. Uh, and they're okay, and they they will also be removed over time. So DeFi tokens is the thing I'm bullish on, David. I will have to say that the fees collected by Uniswap, $2.8 billion of fees, are fees that are paid to liquidity providers, and you have to pay them. So I think Uniswap fairly might get 5% of those fees. If it took a five, oh, that's a pretty steep charge. Uh, but let's run that number, $140 million a year. Uh, in revenue for Uniswap. If Uniswap took a 5% cut on the 0.03% average trading fees of Uniswap LPs. 142 million a year. And what's the cost of that? Like very low. Oh, a couple million. Right? So this is kind of, it's kind of close to profit at that level. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Really cool. I am similarly bullish. Meme of the week, As, sir. If, if we can fix, if we, we can fix DeFi tokens by fixing DAO governance, we've got to fix DAO governance first. True. True. That's uh, that's the topic of yeah. Monday's podcast. Yeah. David, meme of the week. What are we looking at? Meme of the week. Here we go. <laughs> so this is the famous friends meme where Phoebe and Joey are. Phoebe's trying to get Joey to say the words, and so Phoebe goes re, and Joey goes re, and Phoebe goes se, and Joey goes se, and then Phoebe goes eshin. And Joey goes, Eshin. And Phoebe goes, Recession. And then Joey goes, Risk on season. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. 
<laughs> yep. Wait, wait, which one? Which one are you positioned for, Ryan? Um, I am positioned for both. <laughs> Surprise, <laughs> Phoebe and Joey. I got both sides. That's the crypto barbell strategy, Risk my friend. Gone recession. The crypto barbell strategies all weather. Okay. Yeah. That mm -hmm. means you have cash on one side. You have crypto on the other side. You get the maximum risk on, and then you also have the safe haven mm -hmm. risk mm -hmm. off, and nothing in the middle. That's me. Yeah. That's a good meme. This is one of the better memes you've had. Nice, nice meme. Yeah, who did this? Nice meme. Uh, some intern that works with uh, Hoska Trades, whoever oh, cool, that is. Cool. That's some up and coming meme more talent here. Guys, as yeah. always, crypto is risky. None of this has been financial advice. Never is on Bankless. You could definitely lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.